a harmonic energy ladder. So the, we, we, that means that, for instance, here if I call omega minus omega plus to take the, the, the notation of uh, bat batteries yesterday, if you want to go to that level, you have an energy penalty. So like omega minus 2 is not equal to 2 times omega minus, but it's equal to 2 omega minus plus u, okay? plus a term of energy u. And so this can be interpreted as an interaction term. You have an energy penalty to give to your system if you want to introduce an extra particle. And so this is the effective interaction between photons that we get by working in a strong coupling regime between a two-level uh, two emitter and a cavity mode. Actually, last week you got a, a lecture by uh, Atachi Mamoglu. He's the one who invented this word uh, called photon blockade. He, in this paper in 1997, he said strongly interacting, the title was strongly interacting photons in a non-linear cavity. So that's exactly the concept I'm describing here. It was actually understood by uh, Carmichael a few years before who wrote, if you read here, quantum trajectory of two-state behavior in an optical cavity co containing one atom, meaning exactly what I'm trying to say here, that if you are in strong coupling regime between an atom and a cavity, you can just reduce the system to a two-level system, okay, somehow. And so this is why we call this strongly interacting photons. Okay, so this has been realized in various platforms, this kind of model. First time, I think, in 2005 by uh, Jeff Kimball, who, which used a single atom inside an optical cavity, okay, and realized this chance coming model. And then it has been implemented uh, later on in different platforms. I took two recent examples here, one in the group of Jonathan Simon in Chicago, who did something a bit different because let's say like putting one single atom inside the cavity may be a little bit difficult. So he's actually working with a bunch of atoms in the cavity, it's easier, but with a single Rydberg excitation, okay? So it goes to a very high uh, excited state and he uses this concept of uh, photon uh, blockade to realize strong interactions between photons, a strongly interacting polyatonic quantum dot. That's how we named the paper, okay? In the solid state, we have also plenty of examples you heard about quantum dots yesterday, right? So you can, and you will hear today also by uh, Valerian from Candela, you can put a quantum dot, which is a two-level system in the uh, solid state. You can place it in the middle of an optical cavity. You go into the, strong the, the strong coupling regime, and you can also uh, do the same type of physics. So what is the, yeah? Uh, slide. Yeah. Uh, there is. I mean, if uh, if you work with a single a, a, a single two-level system in the cavity, you automatically have this anharmonicity, which comes from the fact that you are coupling like a harmonic oscillator, harmonic system, to just a two-level system. So this square root of n uh, behavior in the coupling will lead automatically to to an anharmonicity in the in the system. Yes. If you work in the weak coupling regime, the story is different. But uh, uh, yeah, in the strong coupling regime. Well, okay, uh, yeah, I think what I'm talking about is in the dispersion regime. Yeah, okay. And so in all these cases, what is the hallmark of these uh, photon interactions, strong photon interactions? You see, um, for instance, in these two pictures I got from these papers, they draw this kind of setup here. This is a Hongu Mendel kind of experiment. You want to show that in the end, because of the strong interaction with the atom, when you send photons, a photon train in the cavity, once one photon has entered the cavity, then all the other ones get reflected because there is no transition at this energy anymore. So the cavity can be filled only with one photon at a time. And so the photons that are going to escape through the cavity, <coughs> they escape one by one. And so you do this setup to try to characterize the single photon emission. So you expect quantum correlation, single photon emission from your cavity. 
You do that by splitting the photon train in two and by measuring coincidences here with two detectors. So if you have single photons, the two detectors should never click at the same time and you observe what is called an anti-bunching in the second order correlation function of your photon train. Okay, so this is, for instance, in this paper, what they measure, the second order correlation function, so the coincidences between the two detectors, and they see that at zero delay here, you have a dip which indicates anti-bunching and which indicates strong interaction between the photons and quantum correlations. Okay, so this shows that in the end, by uh, putting this kind of two-level system inside the cavity, we have managed to create photonic particles, which are a little bit special. They are half-light, half-matter particles, okay? They, have, they are massive, they have a mass, and they interact. Okay, so this already is a good step towards uh, realizing a quantum, uh, like an artificial material with, uh, with photons. So this is actually going to be uh, our elementary brick, if you want, this artificial atom, this photonic atom, in, in the following. Okay, there is one term that has, I haven't discussed yet, which is this J term, the coupling between different cavities. Well, now that we have this artificial atom, we want to create an artificial material, so we need to couple them together. And this is the topic of what I'm going to talk right now. I want to talk about photonic band structures, how you create photonic materials by coupling several of these cavities. Oh. This is a picture I took here from a, from a recent paper. It's just, in general, when you think about cavities, I suppose you, you think about that. Yeah? You have like mirrors and a laser in between that, uh, that oscillates. So this is really a bulk object, bulk <coughs> cavities, I call them. And well, as I was telling you, if we want to couple this together, this sounds a little bit difficult, I would say. I mean, I, I don't know, there may be some ways, but these are really bulk cavities to, to couple them together. It may, may be a little bit tricky. You may be able to play with some special modes in the cavity, I don't know, but well, this is maybe not the, the best way to go. Instead, there are like plenty of ways to actually fabricate micro cavity, to nano fabricate uh, this cavity, to realize very efficiently uh, cavity arrays. Okay? So I gave you a few examples here. Um, these are all scanning electron microscope pictures of different devices. You see, like, I, I put the scales every time, so this is always in the micrometer scale, more or less. Uh, let, let me start with this photonic crystal cavity arrays. Okay, so a photonic crystal is basically it's a slab of material, kind of a waveguide, where the light can, can be confined and propagate. And you are going to put here, you see these are holes, actually. They drill holes in the material, plenty of holes that are regularly spaced. And then sometimes you forget, you, you, you put a defect there. And because you have a defect there, the uh, electromagnetic field is going to be localized in this position and create a mode, a cavity mode. Okay, so this is really a cavity mode of like a few microns size. And so it's really easy in that case to go and to put several of these defects together, different cavities together. And you have here an array of cavities that can be used then to couple them together. There is a coupling between this mode and this mode. Why is there a coupling? Because usually, you know, there is an eva evanescent tail of the field. So there is an eva evanescent coupling between the different sites. Okay. Uh, another example here is micro ring. So this is a, a different material, in silicon. It's like if you want a really small optical fiber where you can put the magnetic field, it propagates, and it's a ring, okay? So it's like you have periodic boundary conditions, if you want, and you have discrete modes that appear there. So same thing, you have like a bunch of modes, and you can realize here, uh, full nanofabrication, an array, regular array, like a square array of such cavities. And these cavities are coupled together with a small link here, through, again, evanescent coupling. When the light arrives here, it can be split between here and there, and so you get like that full connection between uh, nearest neighbors, and so you create a lattice of uh, coupled resonators. Um, I will dedicate now the rest of the talk to this platform. So these are uh, semiconductor exciton polariton lattices that we realize at C2L, and my plan is now to explain to you 
what exactly is uh, this kind of object, how we realize it, and what properties uh, they have. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. Uh, that will come later. Yeah, I forgot to, take, to tell that is a very correct statement. Uh, I took a step back right now. I just explained to you the artificial system, artificial atom, which is made of a cavity mode coupled to some matter excitation. And now I want to spend a little bit of time explaining to you how to realize uh, photonic band structures. And I forget for the moment about the nonlinear medium. This will come back later, okay? So what um, technological means are we uh, using for that? So we are working in the clean room, and we are working with solid state uh, systems, semiconductor materials. Why? Because, I mean, semiconductor materials, they benefit from a lot of uh, developments in, 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 uh, over the, the past year. It's uh, heavily used, for instance, in the, like, like uh, this kind of uh, laser pointers, for instance, is like a, a semiconductor uh, laser, VXL kind of structures. So there are a lot of developments, in particular for the, the, the fabrication, the growth of this material, through techniques of molecular beam epitaxy. So these are techniques. This is a machine, a molecular beam epitaxy chamber. It's a like vacuum chamber, if you want. And then there are different cells of different semiconductor materials, aluminum, gallium, arsenide, uh, indium, like plenty of uh, different materials. And each cell is warmed up to a few hundred degrees in temperature. They emit atoms, and then they go uh, directly on the substrate, which is usually a monocrystal of gallium arsenide that lo looks like that. And it's kind of a me metallic surface, mirror-like surface. And you can grow these materials atomic layer by atomic layer. So I can tell, OK, I want one atomic layer of uh, gallium arsenide. I want one atomic layer of aluminum arsenide, etc. So I can make a full recipe and grow like this a material according to my needs. Um, and then, so this is the fabrication of the, uh, the sample. And the, this uh, kind of samples, then they can be structured, they can be patterned through different techniques related to some things that we heard yesterday, uh, electron lithography, liftoff, etching. So this is, for instance, a picture of a reactive uh, ion etching uh, reactor at, uh, at C2N. And as I was telling you, the, the goal is then to realize this artificial matter on a chip, kind of like this. OK, so how do we make the semiconductor cavities? Uh, in fact, the cavities that we use, they look more like probably the cavities that uh, you, you know you would expect, because they have, uh, if you want, two mirrors, okay, and a space, which is a cavity, like a spacing between these two mirrors. So how do we realize these mirrors? We use the fact that uh, semiconductor materials, they have different indices of, re of refraction. They have different optical properties. Okay, So if I take different materials, for example, gallium arsenide or aluminum arsenide, they're going to have different index of refraction. I can give you some, some order of magnitude just for your, for your information. For instance, the index of refraction of gallium arsenide is typically of the order of 3.5, okay? whereas the index of refraction of aluminum arsenide is more of the order of 2.9. Okay? So when you stack different, of this ma uh, different materials like this, they have different indices of refraction, and so uh, you can create a distributed Bragg reflector mirror, which is a pile of these uh, materials with different index of refraction and with a thickness, an optical thickness of lambda over 4. Okay? So we pack typically 60 you know, like of this order, 60 of these layers, lambda over 4 in thickness, so somewhere between 60 and 70 nanometers. Huh? It's just we work at 800, so 800 divided by 3 gives you that, that uh, order of magnitude. And with that, we create one mirror. Then we, play, we place a spacer, so we grow like a lambda layer of, uh, of uh, gallium arsenide, and then we put a second mirror on top. And with that, the light gets confined here uh, in the middle, at the interface between the two mirrors, and we get a cavity mode, which has, as I described earlier, a parabolic uh, dispersion. Yes? 
Well, how do we excite the cavity? Then uh, you need to see, like, you need to imagine that this is really a 2D, if you want, like a planar sample, okay? And we excite it from the top, from here. So you take a laser here, laser light, that you, let's say, focus on the spot here, on the front surface of the cavity. And then the cavity just uh, operates like a normal cavity. It's a filter, if you want. If you are at resonance, it goes through, and then you collect the photons. If you are off resonance, it reflects off, okay? Ah, yeah, yeah, the mirror, mirror is a mirror, so if you take a single mirror and you excite your mirror, like 99.99% of the light will reflect. But the magic of the optical cavity is like when you put two mirrors in front of each other, you have this, uh, this kind of resonances that appear and uh, create the cavity mode. So that's what uh, we are going to use here. Actually, this is a bit related to your question. My next slide is like how to probe the optical uh, cavity. So we excite it with a field, a laser field, that we focus on top of the cavity. And then, all the rest, when I'm going to show you, I'm always going to talk to you about two different kind of measurements, either what I call real space imaging. So real space imaging for me means I am just imaging the front or the back surface of the sample. So I'm doing an image of the sample onto a detector, a CCD camera. So typically, you can do that with an or, uh, even a number of lenses. Huh, you see, at this point here is image on this point on the camera. And you get a full image of your, uh, of your sample. I also do what uh, I call momentum space imaging, Fourier space imaging, or K space imaging. Okay, this I can use all this this word. Whenever I talk about this momentum space imaging, we uh, we use here an odd uh, number of lenses. So what you see is like instead of imaging one point of the sample onto the CCD, it's more like all the light that comes with a given angle, for instance this angle here, will be imaged on one point on the CCD. So with that, I have directly uh, an image on the CCD of the distribution as a function of the angle. So as a function of the wave vector k. So I can plot a Fourier space image. So image of this plane here onto the CCD, which is useful then to make uh, dispersions, as I will show just now. So when I do real space imaging, for instance, real space imaging of the planar uh, sample, what I get here at the output is an image of my cavity mode. Okay, so it's like a, some sort of Gaussian here. Uh, that is image on the camera, which gives me actually uh, a, a direct uh, image of the mode profile of the density of photons inside uh, the cavity. So that gives me uh, really uh, this kind of imaging. And uh, we can do interferometry, for instance, to measure the phases. And so you, you get directly both the measurement of the density and the phase by doing real space imaging. By doing Fourier space imaging, as I was telling you, you measure on your CCD, you get as a function of the K angle, an image of your intensity. And if you go through a spectrometer, so you put a slit, one axis you will get a K axis or an angle axis. And on the other axis, you will disperse the energy. And so you get a plot of the energy as a function of the angle, as a function of k. And so this is directly an image of your dispersion relation. So here I did it here for a cavity. And what you notice is that, as I didn't lie to you, as I was telling you, this cavity has a parabolic dispersion relation. Here you see a parabola, which is an indication of uh, the massive, uh, the effective mass. You can uh, fit it by a parabola and measure directly the effective mass of your photon in the cavity. Yes. But the typical size of the mode profile is related to your spot, the excitation spot area. So that can vary. But usually, we actually don't work so much with these 2D planar samples, but we do etching of the samples. So the idea is you start with that. You have a big, big uh, disk, if you want, of material. And you go into the clean room, and you do what we call etching. So you sculpt the material by uh, bombarding it, if you want, with ions that are going to destroy everything, but some part of it that are being carefully uh, designed through some uh, lithography techniques. Um, so what we do typically, our uh, kind of uh, elementary brick, will be a single pillar. We call it a pillar, a post. It's uh, this cylinder here of a few microns in diameter. And then in this kind of cylinder, 
The light is not only confined along this direction by the action of the two mirrors here, but is also going to be confined in all directions because it's like if you want in an optical fiber, you have a step index. You have here an in a material with 3.5 index of refraction, and here you have vacuum, you have n equal one. So the light through total internal uh, 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 ref reflection is confined in all directions inside this tiny, tiny volume of a few micrometer cube. This is a scanning electron microscope image of a sample. So you see, I mean, it's quite uh, versatile in terms of uh, fabrication. We can do whatever kind of structure we want. We can do big rectangular pillars like this, that are like really tens of microns, but we can go really small and do a few micron in diameter uh, pillars, okay? So I described to you just earlier how to measure the dispersion. And we had for the planar cavity this nice parabolic parabola. Uh, we can do the same with the pillar. So again, same thing. We excite from the top, okay? We have the laser, we focus it on the top, and we measure in transmission whatever goes through the cavity as a function of the energy. And what you see here is like you recover indeed this kind of parabola, but now you have discrete states, okay? It's not continuous anymore. Why is that? Because we have confined the, line in all, the light in all directions. So now through this confinement, you get discrete modes, discrete energy levels. And you see that if I vary the size of the pillar, here I start with 20 microns, so there is not so much confinement. So it's almost still continuous. You see the modes are really closely spaced. Whereas if I start to decrease the diameter a lot, go to eight or five microns here, then the spacing starts to increase and we really have like this discrete energy modes. The lowest energy mode here has this symmetry. It's like a Gaussian-like, okay? So it's like this S kind of orbital for an artificial atom, if you want. The next mode here has this kind of symmetry here, okay? It looks like this. Reminds you maybe of the P mode, the P orbital of an atom, okay? So we have this photonic atom here. And these photonic atoms, we can couple them together through evanescent coupling. So I consider here a single site, and I focus on these two states, the S state, what I call the S state and the P state. These are the first two discrete energy modes of the pillar through this confinement. And you can put them together. You place them next to each other. And if you want the, 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 the light, is going to leak out a little bit through the pillar. The first one, that is two pillars. And here you have a bit of an overlap, so you have an evanescent coupling between the two modes. And if I do the spectroscopy of this device here, you have two pillars next to each other which are evan evanescently coupled. What you see is you have several states that appear here. And these are really the molecular states of this kind of dimer molecule. You start with an S orbital for pillar one, an S orbital for pillar two, and through the coupling, you get now two different states, the bonding states here, and the anti-bonding states there, which have the symmetry of the bonding state and the bonding state. You can do the same in the P mode, okay? And you have uh, this hybridized mode through the coupling of the two atoms. Just a word quickly to say, this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, structure, if you, want, if you want to describe them, you need to solve the Maxwell equation. It's really a 3D problem. You can solve the 3D Maxwell equation for the device, and you will get the distribution of the, electronic magnetic, uh, the electric and magnetic fields in the device. We, in the end, reduce the problem and uh, work only with the essential uh, ingredients. Through some symmetry and all, you can say, okay, I will, I will just describe this as, for instance, two particles in a box. It's a 1D problem. And this is a, a possibility just to describe what I, I, I did. And then eventually the, the simplest level of, uh, like, the, like the ultimate level of simplification you can, you can get to describe this system is just a two by two matrix. You have two modes here, left and right, with left and right energies, and you have a coupling G, okay? And that describes basically the essence of, of the physics. So that's how we are going to be able to map our system, our lattices, 
to a tight binding Hamiltonian, okay? In the end, the Hamiltonian of the system is going to write as H times this term, number of photons times the energy of the mode, plus some coupling terms between the nearest neighbors of the lattice, okay? So we started with two, and now we can go further, right? We can make a line of pillars, 1D line of pillars, okay? And we can measure, again, real space, K space, as a function of uh, position or as a function of angle and momentum. <coughs> I can measure the energies. And what I get here through the coupling of all these atoms is band structures. So I have the S bands here that appear through the hybridization of the S modes of all these pillars, the P bands, etc. And if I look at the dispersion relation, then I can see like the different bands as a function of K, okay? We, cannot, we, we don't have to stop there, we can go 2D. And so I come back to what I showed initially in the first slide, this kind of graphene honeycomb uh, lattice structure and a dispersion measurement for this lattice. This is a calculated band structure for the graphene. You see, you have like different bands with here direct points where the bands are touching and you can measure. This is a cut here at one given uh, Kx as a function of Ky. You can see here the S-bands. They show indeed this kind of dispersive behavior with these touching points here that correspond to the direct points of the dispersion relation of graphene. And then you have like more complex dispersion due to the P-band uh, hybridization. But with this, uh, pillar structures coupled to each other through the, this kind of tie binding approach, we managed to simulate graphene and to realize a photonic uh, graphene uh, analog and measure the dispersion of, uh, of graphene. Okay? But as you pointed out earlier, for the moment, now I have completely forgotten about the interactions and the nonlinear medium. And this is the next point I want to discuss. What about the active material? What about the interactions? So I have discussed about the optical properties of gallium arsenide, of the semiconductor materials. These materials, they also have interesting uh, electronic properties, of course. So these are crystal, and they have this kind of crystalline structure. And they are semiconductor materials, which means that if you look here, alors this is a calculating band dispersion, it's complex hein, for, the, for the material. What you notice is that uh, at this point here, you have a gap in energy between the valence bands and the conduction bands, okay? And this gap here, energy, is more or less corresponds at 4K to a wavelength, an energy that is compatible with like this 815 nanometer wavelength. So it's optically active in the near infrared, so this is convenient for us. And basically, by shining a laser at an energy which is slightly above this, you can excite one electron for the valence band to the conduction band here. And this electron will leave a hole in the, conduction, in, in the valence band that can, be, can form a complex, which is called an exciton. It's a bound state, bounds through the Coulomb interaction of an electron and a hole. Okay? So this is the elementary electronic excitation of your semiconductor that you can excite optically this kind of excitons. Um, and so different materials, they have not only different indices of refraction, but they have also different electronic properties, and in particular, different energy gaps like this. And this can be uh, useful to confine the charge carriers into the structure. So through uh, this, what we call band gap engineering, we can form uh, uh, semiconductor heterostructures where the charge carriers are going to be uh, confined. Now, the ultimate level of confinement that can be reached in this system, and you will hear more about that this afternoon, uh, is the zero-D confinement. So this is called a semiconductor quantum dot. This is obtained, basically, by uh, growing on top of gallium arsenide, a material with a very different uh, lattice constant. And so because of that, the, so like indium gallium arsenide here, this material is going to form a really small island, few nanometer cube, okay? Uh, this is a transmission electron microscope of such quantum dots. So you see you have this tiny, tiny island here. And uh, as we also saw yesterday in uh, Leven's talk, this kind of quantum dots uh, can be used as an artificial atom. It's a two-level system, right? That has been used to realize single photon emission, entanglement, uh, cryptography, 
And as uh, you, uh, I already said, Valerian will talk more about that later. So we could, use, we could say, well, why not put this kind of two-level system inside the cavity? And there is a drawback, uh, there is a problem here, which is like this uh, quantum dots. They are called self-assembled quantum dots. So they just assemble by themselves through, through strain and mechanical constraint during the growth of the material. And they are randomly placed first, and they have very different energies or optical properties where, where, when you look at them individually. So this is like the first, 1994, the discovery of these quantum dots. People observed a full series of energy lines. So you see they all emit at different um, wavelengths. So this is absolutely not convenient if you want to realize a regular array of uh, two-level systems in uh, an array of uh, cavities. And actually, so far, there is no uh, existing technology to realize such uh, regular arrays of self-assembled quantum dots. And it is actually an axis of research. So it's more like material science, but many people are trying to work on that and find some ways to grow uh, uh, quantum dots in, in a more uh, reliable fashion. So just before the break, I will finish uh, with that by saying that since the zero deconfinement is too much for us, what we are going to do is we are going to work with 2D materials, okay, 2D active materials. So we are not going to confine in all directions, like a quantum dot, but we are going to work with a quantum well, semiconductor quantum well. And because of that, we are 2D, so it's completely homogeneous, and we don't have this problem of homogeneity anymore, and we can create pattern, a lattice of cavities on top of that with conserving the same kind of uh, optical properties. I give you just quickly, I make the connection with the class of Atachimamoglu that you got last week. Uh, in the rest of the talk, I will describe uh, 2D materials that are semiconductor quantum wells obtained during the, the, the MB growth of our samples. Um, some people, many people, it's a, an axis of research that developed recently, actually use the new types of materials like TMD monolayers that you heard about that are also semiconductor materials at the level of a monolayer. And it's really an interesting development to try to uh, combine them with cavities and uh, create polaritons with that. I don't know if Attach talked about that, but this is uh, also uh, some current uh, uh, axis of research that is developed to try to find new materials to optimize some of the properties of the, of, uh, of the artificial materials. And I will just finish by saying that, OK, we are going to work with excitons in a quantum well, which means that we are not in a, we, we won't have a two-level system. That's the drawback. We, are, we don't have a quantum dot, so we don't have confinement in all directions. We won't be working with a two-level system. But instead, our excitons are quantum well excitons that are going to be able to propagate in the, plan, in the plane here. And they are going to have, again, this kind of parabolic dispersion. They are massive particles, OK? These excitons are massive particles that are described by a bosonic field. Uh, Hx is equal to this parabola times number of excitons. Okay? And so after the break, I will tell you how to couple uh, these excitons and uh, quantum excitons and photons together to create uh, polaritons in lattices. Okay. Question. Well, typically, we are going to work with, uh, I'm going to tell you, uh, give you a quality factor number, if you prefer, um, between, let's say, 10,000 and 100,000 optical quality factor. The higher, the better, of course, because of, um, well, I don't know. <laughs> Depends on what you want to do. Uh, uh, because of residual absorptions in the material and all, it's a little bit hard to, to go above. But if you want, like 10 to the 5 is the state of the art kind of number one can reach in these kind of cavities. Yes. Um, just didn't get to the previous slide. Yeah. Uh, where did you, like, did you create, okay, did you make the micro like, inside the quantum well? Or? No. For the moment, I, this is 2D. I'm telling you the active material is going to be a 2D material, okay, that is going to be inside the cavity, and then we are going to etch the cavity on top of that. Okay? 
through the techniques that I, I described earlier. But earlier I was uh, focusing, if you want, just on the photonic part. And now we are just we just need to think that okay, inside this cavity we are adding an active material, which for reasons that I explained is not going to be a two-level system, but is going to be a two D material, very homogeneous, but whose excitation are described not by uh, just uh, Pauli matrices, but by uh, uh, bosonic operator B. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, okay. The, the best, the most obvious way to do it, of course, is to make another sample. You can, uh, on the same kind of sample, you can really uh, uh, design a few lattices with different parameters. So we do that very often. We have, like, on, on a given sample, plenty of parameters, and we go from one lattice to the other to vary the parameter. There are some way, optically, to tune the tight binding parameters uh, by shining locally an excitation laser. I will actually mention that a little bit at the, if I have time at the end of the second lecture, that how we can introduce optical defects, for instance, or modify some of the tight binding parameters optically. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when, when, you, when you're looking at the interaction of the photons, uh, you, you have this, this, uh, uh, this term, but it still acts as the square root of n. So Um, we'll see that a little bit later. We can uh, indeed inject more particles, but uh, well, I, I'll talk about that. Then we will go into the mean field regime, which means that we won't be quantum anymore. But uh, no, we are not limited to to that. Yeah. All right. So let's okay. have a break now. Two important announcements.
Voilà. I'm turning this back on. I just uh, during the break, I got a couple of uh, time the same question about well, how do we measure exactly this uh, this dispersion, and how do we ma well, wh where does this energy axis comes from? So I just went on Wikipedia just to to show you how the spectrometer works, because what we do basically is we go through a spectrometer. So we, we send the light that comes from the cavity onto this device. There is a slit in front. Depending on whether we are doing real space or case space, we will have along the slit either the x or the theta k axis. And then the light goes through a set of mirrors, is dispersed by a dispersive element that can be a prism, that can be a grating, right? And then, as a function of the energy, we will hit a different point on the detector, which is usually a camera. Okay, so along one axis of the camera, you have the energy, and along the other axis of the camera, you have either x, the real space, or k, the reciprocal space. And that's how we can reconstruct directly this, uh, these dispersions. Okay. So now I will go back to the slides. Voila. OK. So we have seen uh, before the break that we can create a mirror, uh, yeah, a mirror or even a cavity, by using two DBR mirrors, using the optical properties of different semiconductor materials. Uh, and they have a parabolic dispersion. And they are described by this bon bosonic operator, A. Okay, so E C of k, which is the parabola, a dagger k. And then what we, what we are going to do from now on is that inside the cavity, during the growth, okay, we have carefully designed the sample such that at the center of the cavity, right at the center of the cavity, there is a semiconductor quantum well. Okay? Uh, this is typically, in our case, 17 to 20 nanometer layer of materials and we use indium gallium arsenide in general. OK, fine. Um, we have tuned it carefully uh, also, such that the electronic transition to excite this exciton that I described earlier, this electron hole pair bound by the Coulomb interaction, is exactly at the same energy as the cavity mode. OK? So again, you send light into the cavity. Light can be absorbed by the quantum well. You create an exciton. The exciton is re-emitted some time later into the cavity. And since we are in the strong coupling regime, it creates a photon that can still re-excite and re-emit several times like this, the exciton, uh, in, uh, in the system. As I was telling, we have a 2D system. So the exciton here is uh, described by this bosonic operator, B dagger B, with also a parabolic dispersion, I tell you. Excitons are as well massive particles. They are massive particles, but compared to the photon, they are super heavy, OK? The photon, if I give you an order of magnitude, typically, the mass of the photon is of the order of 10 to the minus 5, the mass of the electron, OK? Whereas the mass of the exciton is well of the order of the mass of the electron, more or less, OK? So there is this 10 to the 5 order of magnitude difference between the masses, and because of that, if you want this dispersion, I will consider co it completely flat. Okay, so the exciton is flat; it doesn't uh, almost doesn't disperse at the scale of the, that, that we are looking at here. Well, now as I, I was describing you this emission reabsorption process, okay, so we need to write the coupling Hamiltonian between the uh, photon field and the, the, and the exciton field, and this is the Hamiltonian that Patrice as well showed uh, yesterday. It's really similar to the James Cumming Hamiltonian, OK? Except that uh, instead of uh, using, as, as we did earlier, you remember there was this E, G, A, plus G, E, A dagger. This time, we are using bosonic operator. So we have A dagger B plus B dagger A, OK? But it describes the, the same kind of process absorption and re-emission. OK. So the total Hamiltonian of the system eh, is, is uh, written here. If you want, again, this is kind of a, a two by two 
two by two matrix, the, 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 the Hamiltonian writes as uh, A dagger, B dagger times H bar omega over two, H, sorry, on the diagonal I put the energy, E cavity of K, E exciton of K, and then you have this coupling term, H bar omega over two, H bar omega over two times A B. Okay, so that's how I can write the Hamiltonian, and this is basically a two by two matrix, which is easy to diagonalize by doing some rotation. So I just give you the result here. I consider that I mean there exists a basis uh, where the Hamiltonian is going to be written as an energy of the lower polariton plus energy of the upper polariton with the bosonic modes here, L and U, that describes the coupled modes, okay, and that are obtained simply by a rotation. L and U can be expressed as a function of A and B uh, according to this uh, uh, rotation matrix, which depends on K, okay, this angle depends on K, and can be expressed as a function of the energy of the, uh, the, the, the photon, the exciton, the rapid coupling, etc. So we are in the strong coupling regime of cavity QD, as we described yesterday. So what do we expect? We expect uh, avoided crossings, right? So this, again, is in dashed lines. You have the photon uh, energy dispersion, parabola, as a function of K. And you have the exciton energy dispersion, which is, as I was telling you, also a parabola, but very really flat at this scale. Uh, and for each value uh, of K, you have a two by two matrix to diagonalize and you get the new modes, the eigenmodes of the systems, which are plotted here in blue. This is a measurement, by the way. Yeah? This is uh, measured on the CCD camera again. And you, 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 you got directly the, the energies of the, what we call upper polariton mode here, okay? And lower polariton mode, that are the coupled modes. You notice in particular here, there is a very particular point. When the energy of the exciton and the energy of the photon are equal, then you have two same energy plus a coupling term. You expect to have here two modes that are separated by twice the coupling energy, which was h bar omega over two. So you get here this Rabi coupling here, okay? And as you change k, you change the detuning somehow. You see, like the energy of the cavity here is smaller than the energy of the exciton. Here, the energy of the exciton is smaller than the energy of the cavity. So you are going to, to change the, the way the modes uh, are distributed according to this formula. But you always get this coupled mode, this polariton mode, as they are plotted here. I can actually write uh, the lower polariton uh, uh, operator here can be expressed as a function of A dagger and B dagger as cos theta A plus sin, sin theta B dagger. So starting from the vacuum state, I can apply this operator here and express what is this one polariton in a mod K. How does it express as a function of photon plus exciton? You see that this state writes as cos theta times one photon in the uh, uh, cavity uh, mode, zero excitons, plus sine of theta K, zero photon, one exciton. So again, this is a superposition mode, a mixed mode of an exciton and a photon. Your polariton state is partially a photon, partially an exciton. It currently ex the oscillates between both. And because of that, you have both photonic and matter particle. We come back to the same idea that by coupling uh, the photon to a nonlinear medium, we are going to be able to uh, create some nonlinearity and therefore some interactions for the polaritons. Here, this plot is also a bit interesting. This is actually cos squared theta and sine squared theta for the lower polariton. So you see that, I mean, it gives you basically what is the photon weight, how much of a photon you are, if you want, how much of an exciton you are. And this, of course, varies as a function of k. When k is equal to zero, you see that the energy of the photon is much lower than the energy of the exciton. So your polariton mode is going to be mostly photonic, okay? Your, your new eigenstate is going to be, let's say, 80% photon, which is like what you see here, 85% photon, and 
15% exciton. Okay? On the other hand, if you go here at this k, now you see that the lowest energy here is the exciton, and the energy of the photon is much higher. So when you diagonalize your system, your polariton mode here is going to be mostly exciton. You see that you have sine squared, which is almost equal to 1, okay? and uh, almost no, 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 no photon. Where you are exactly here at resonance, you have one half. It's half photon, half exciton. So you can tune this parameter, of course, and uh, you can work with whatever you, you prefer, depending on uh, whether you want uh, rather photonic or rather excitonic particles. OK. Polariton, polariton interactions. So let's go back to the interaction part. How we want, again, to, to, to create quantum correlations in the system. We want to create an artificial quantum material. And for that, we need correlations. And well, I haven't got the question yet, but you may be a little bit surprised at the moment because I have, uh, I have described the system as a coupling between two bosonic systems. I have the photon, which is a, bos a bosonic field, OK? So it's a harmonic oscillator. I have my quantum L exciton field, which is also a bosonic operator. So we have two harmonic oscillators that we couple to with each other. This is going to give you an harmonic oscillator. There is no nonlinearity at the moment. And this is what we see here. If I just diagonalize the system, it's a little bit different from the James Cumming model because now you see you can, you can uh, have coupling between more states. So the multiplicities here is not only two at each energy, but whatever. What matters is that here, if you look, the energy that you need to create one lower polariton of the system and the energy that you need to go up from this to that, they are the same, OK? So you have an harmonic oscillator again, an harmonic ladder. You don't have at the moment the photon blockade or the, qu the, 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 the quantum correlations that I was describing earlier. So this is a problem. And this is because we need actually to account for an extra term, which is the exciton-exciton interaction. So this is the plan right now. I'm going to describe you briefly how we account for the nonlinearity in the system. And well, this is a, actually a difficult problem if you want to, to, to take it from scratch. It was described for the first time in 1998 by uh, Cristiano Ciuti, uh, who was measuring or like calculating the, the interaction between two excitons. So you have two electron hole pairs that are bound by the Coulomb interactions, E h, E prime, h prime. OK, fine. And they are described by this, this Hamiltonian. You have the kinetic energy part for each of the holes, each of the electrons. And then you have Coulomb interaction, okay, Coulombic interaction between electron and hole, electron and electron, hole and hole, all the terms. Okay, it's a complex problem. What Cristiano Ciuti did at the time is like he looked carefully at this Hamiltonian, did some calculation, and realized that there is a dominant term in this interaction energy, and the dominant term is the exchange of carriers in some sort of elastic uh, scattering. Okay, so it's an exchange interaction where, for instance, Electron is going to exchange with the electron, hole with hole, you know, this kind of, this type of electron process. And actually, this is very uh, conveniently described by the following term. So you can describe it uh, nicely. I mean, it's an approximation, of course, but by some contact to body interaction, okay, where you have one exciton that arrives in the mode K, another one that arrives in the mode K. They interact, they collide, if you want, and two of them ex exit with k minus q and k plus q, OK? This uh, actually writes, if you want to write the Hamiltonian, so the full Hamiltonian uh, for the exciton, there is, well, this term that we wrote until now. You need to add this Coulomb interaction here, where you annihilate two excitons in k modes and k prime modes. You create two new excitons in k prime minus q, k plus q, with an amplitude that depends on q which is given by the Coulomb potential interaction, which usually we approximate here to be around q equals 0. So you have basically just this interaction term. So this is the full uh, interaction term for the exciton field. Okay. And so now we can actually go back to the lower polariton Hamiltonian. I showed you that the lower polariton Hamiltonian is obtained as a linear combination of the photon field and the exciton field. And so we can perturbatively add, on top of that, the interaction for the lower polaritons. 
I wanted to ask the question, but now the answer, I, I forgot in my slides, the answer is already in the board, but I wanted to ask you, in your opinion, now that I have written the interaction Hamiltonian as such for the exciton, what is going to be the interaction Hamiltonian for the uh, polariton? And since the polariton, I told you, is half photon, half matter particle, it is going to be an exciton according to this probability amplitude, sine of theta k. So the interaction term here needs to be uh, adjusted according to this, this uh, probability amplitude. If, if this is really small, so you are mostly photonic, you are going to have very small interactions. So this term is going to be uh, almost equal to zero. If you are really excitonic, almost uh, very far detuned uh, the, 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 the cavity, then you will recover the exciton-exciton interaction. But OK, this is uh, actually a term that you need to account for to describe uh, the, the part light by mat part matter interaction. And again, we are going to consider, make an approximation here, that we can just take <coughs> the sign uh, outside the sum, and we have this kind of term, L dagger k plus q, L dagger k minus q, L k, L k. OK, and so now I'm happy because, you see, uh, we have diagonalized the Hamiltonian for the polariton without accounting for interactions, and we had still uh, a harmonic oscillator ladder. So two, like omega two LP until now was equal to two omega one LP, which was bad. But now if I account for these repulsive interactions between the excitons, this level is going to be slightly shifted by the interaction U. And so now you have omega two LP, which is equal to two omega one LP plus U. So you have recovered this interaction term for uh, the polaritons, for the lower polaritons, and uh, you have this anharmonic uh, ladder, which means that, okay, fine, you can hope of doing a uh, polariton blockade with this, this kind of system. This was actually first proposed in 2006 by uh, Chuti and Caruzotto here, and they call it polariton blockade uh, with bosonic operator, which was different from the photon blockade proposed by Atachi Mamoglu with a two-level system in the cavity. Yes? Yeah, this is an approximation. Here we consider that uh, we are going to work around uh, the, the, the bottom of the dispersion and uh, we allow ourselves to take this sign outside. Okay, we don't consider the full dispersion. There is here an approximation, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so I think now I have given all the ingredients to show how we are going to be able to do bossy part physics with the, the polaritons. So, we have a microcavity, semiconductor microcavity, with an active material inside, which is a quantum well, uh, and we can etch it, okay, to realize a single site for the type binding model. I am going to focus only on the lowest energy mode, this S mode, and I can write the Hamiltonian as, well, the energy S, number of polaritons in this mode, plus the interaction term, L dagger, L dagger, LL, for the lower polariton. And now if I assemble several of these pillars into a lattice. I told you earlier how we can do this mapping to a tight binding model. You have an, an Hamiltonian that writes as such, and this you should recognize the bossy part Hamiltonian, okay? So by putting a nonlinear medium inside the cavity and by assembling several of these cavity together, together we are able to uh, recover a bossy part Hamiltonian. Uh, this is not the full story because <laughs> I simplified here. I was focusing only on the Hamiltonian part of the system. I was telling you uh, initially that uh, the, the polariton system is a photonic system. So in order to excite it, you need a drive. You need to drive it constantly. There is a CW laser constantly uh, on the laser, on, on, the, on the system, and there is dissipation. The, the photons, they constantly escape through the cavity. The typical uh, lifetime for our polaritons is of the order of, te of 10 to 100 picoseconds, okay? So they constantly come out of the system, which means that if you want to really do the full description, you need to add the laser drive here. So this is just a field operator that you add, okay? And then when you solve the problem, in fact, you need to, 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 to solve a master equation where you have here 
a dissipation term that accounts for the photon loss through the system. Okay? So this is actually the full equation of the system. And this is what our quantum simulator, our, uh, photonic material, will, will simulate. It is a driven dissipative version of the boson part, which is probably slightly different from the other kind of uh, 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 things you saw about the, the boson part model. And my goal now is going to show you what kind of things, different things we can do uh, thanks to this drive and dissipation. Okay? So the... The, the general vision is the following. This is a picture that I took from uh, this, this paper by Le Boite et al, 2013, where, okay, you have, this is what I just described, uh, a bunch of sites. These are cavities. You have an interaction term of the boss bar, this U term. You have a hopping term, J. You have a coherent driving, which is the driving field, and you have losses. Okay, so this accounts for all this model. And so what we want to do is look at this drive, driven dissipative nonlinear physics, okay? Uh, we are in an open system, so the physics is slightly different from what you saw in isolated system. This is a non-equilibrium physics, and we are going to ask questions like, how do the many body states of the boss bar survive, for instance, when you introduce dissipation? Can you, through some engineering of the driving field, realize new steady state, new phases of matter? Uh, and also, what are the consequences for photonic devices? Can you use some of these concepts to uh, create new devices like new lasers, waveguides, isolators, for instance? I have two questions there. Yeah? Yes, absolutely. Okay, that's th that comes next. That's the trick. <laughs> I, I will tell you the state of the art later. And th there is a, a, a small uh, issue there, I would say. Well, I mean, this is like current, uh, the current topic of research that I want to describe later. I want first to give you an example of uh, like this driven dissipative Bosubad physics, what kind of uh, things they can perform. Uh, and this is a theory paper uh, that uh, uh, dates from 2009 from Jacopo Carosotto and uh, Atachi Mamoglu again. Um, and they looked at, well, the physics with just a five side lattice with periodic boundary condition, the physics of these impenetrable bosons in 1D. Okay, so this driven dissipative boson part physics in 1D. And they look at what happens as a function of these two boson part parameters. U, U, the interaction, and J. And what they showed is that if you manage to reach a regime where U is large compared to J, you can be in this kind of situation where we measure, they propose to measure, they calculate here, uh, they calculate second order correlations coming out of the system, and they want to show how like quantum correlations emerge in the system. Um, if I look here at the second order correlation on one single site. So what they do is they collect photons that come from one single site and they perform this Henry Brown and Twist experiment. They look at the statistics. They look at G2 of zero, okay? So if you look at the single site and you are in this blockade, polariton blockade regime, as I was showing you earlier, you expect to have single photon trains coming out of the system and you have a G2 that goes down to zero. This is the polariton blockade on a single site. What is interesting now is that if you look at cross correlations between different sites, so you take photons that come from this site and photons that come from the other site, then you see a strong bunching in that case. You see you go up to, let's say, 100 uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, G2 of zero, which shows that now if you detect a photon here, there is a very high probability that you, you will detect it in a, a different site. And so with this, you can generate a, a quantum correlation, not only in the temporal domain, not only this G2 of tau equals zero, but also in the spatial domain. So you can engineer photon states that are spatially entangled uh, across the device. And so you can use the dissipation to collect this photon, so to create like new kind of uh, 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 sp spatial on, uh, temporal uh, entanglement uh, in your photon train, first of all. And you can also adjust the pump, the drive of your system, in order to excite different type uh, of states. So they show in the paper that if you adjust the pump power or if you, if you adjust uh, uh, 
uh, the, the, the energy of the pump, you will access, you will be able to engineer different uh, photon states. Yes? So is there a reason, because this is like um, correlated emission, yeah. is there a reason why you expect to see two photons at the same time, or is it just like looking at, say, emission that's kind of nearby, like times and times? And yeah. Yeah, if, if you adjust the, the energy and the drive of the photon to the, the, what they show in the paper is you can find some resonances where you will have uh, indeed a, a strong probability to uh, excite two photons in the system with some particular uh, uh, spatial correlation, so entanglement in the system. If I was like a very, very large system instead of five sites, would you still expect to see like, long-range correlations? In yes, indeed. You will yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> So yeah, this is one example of application of why, why this uh, drive and dissipation, drive and dissipative is interesting and maybe also connected to device physics in the sense that you can potentially create new types of uh, single photon sources. Alors, let's, let's switch now to the state of the art uh, and, and I will just tell you a little bit where we are with these numbers. So the, the goal, the general goal is the following. You want to reach the polariton blockade, so you want I, I drew again this anharmonic energy ladder for the polariton. You have this photon energy here, you place a second photon, and you have a displacement uh, due to the interaction. What you want is to compare this interaction value to something, and the something in our case is gamma. Gamma is the photon lifetime, which translates in the spectral domain in some width, okay, width of the resonance. So if you want to be in the blockade regime, you want to make sure that this interaction energy here is larger than the line width so that uh, you are not going to excite through the tails of this, uh, this, uh, this Lorentzian of this line, you are not to, uh, going to excite a second photon. So what you want ultimately is to reach the regime where U is larger than gamma. Okay. So what can we do at the moment? What we can do at the moment in our state-of-the-art cavities is the following. We have a line width, which typically is of the order of 10 micro EV, okay? So a few tens of picoseconds lifetime. And uh, the typical interaction value is of the order of one micro EV for the typical sample that I showed you at the moment. Which means that this U over gamma is equal to one over 10. So we are not there. We are not in, the, in, in this photon uh, blockade regime. Some people, however, have tried to look into quantum correlations in, in a very similar system as, uh, as uh, ours, in particular in the group of Atachi Mamoglu again. And while well, they measure this, they, they look at uh, the uh, second order correlation function coming out of uh, uh, a polariton system. And they observe a slight level of uh, quantum correlation, slight level of anti budging of the order of 5% which is small, but which is there, at least, that shows that, indeed, there is some, some hope in uh, building up some quantum correlation in the system, although, at the moment, uh, the interactions are a little bit too weak to be able to go very strong into the bosch uh, ebert regime. I will, at the end of the lecture, give you some perspective, uh, well, yeah, on uh, how to enhance interaction. Okay, but I keep that for the end. Give you a little bit of state of the art. What is the current state of the, the, the research in terms of quantum polaritonics? What people have been looking at as quantum effects? In a semiconductor micropillar in 2014, was observed some level of squeezing. Okay, so you can engineer squeeze state. This is this is possible. Um, another line of research that is being developed is the following: uh, to actually excite the polariton field with a single photon source. Bon, it's a little bit less interesting because you are not really using the non-linearity of your, your system to reach the, the, the quantum regime, but you can also do quantum optics like that just by using a single photon source as an input, okay? And very recently here, we, in collaboration with some, some people, we, we looked at the effect of interaction on the, the rotation of the polarization of a photon. It's a special effect that we managed to observe a rotation effect at the level of a single photon, okay? So this is basically where we are with quantum and polaritons. And so an, another way to increase the interaction energy in the system, or not at the single level, photon level uh, anymore, but of course, but you, you, you have seen that the interaction energy, as I was showing you, depends in terms of U, but also depends on the density, U times N. So if 
I incre increase here the density of polaritons. I work with more than one, like 10, 100 polaritons. The total interaction energy is going to increase. So this is a possibility to increase the polariton density. And so then we are not at the single photon level anymore. We are at the mean field level. And this is a field of uh, fluids of light, polariton fluids of light, that I am going to describe briefly now. Um, many things can be done in this regime. So now we are coming out of the quantum regime, okay? Uh, but at the mean field regime, people have been looking, for instance, at both Einstein condensation of polaritons. So there is some way to do <coughs> open or non-equilibrium both Einstein condensation of exciton polaritons. Okay, there are plenty of experiments on that. You can look at superfluidity of polaritons, these polaritons, and I will try to, to, to explain you that uh, briefly, can also behave as a superfluid. And they show like hydrodynamics effect, like solitone vortices, and also the specialists really of this are the, the, the people at uh, uh, LKB, uh, Quentin, and uh, uh, Alberto Barnati. They have done really a lot on that. Um, okay, so this is where I was supposed to stop the previous uh, lecture. So I will now voilà, <laughs> go to the next one. And the next one is about well, the, the, the mean field regime and uh, how we can describe the system, not as a driven dissipative Bosio-Bad model anymore, but as um, uh, a, a fluid of light. Okay, I'll, I'll accelerate a little. No, I don't know. I will do whatever. Uh, you ask me questions and we, we, we see where we can go. Uh, I just rewrote the Hamiltonian here. Uh, this time, I kept only the Hamiltonian part. I, I wrote it in real space because from now on, I would like to work with the field operator for the lower polariton, but in the real space. Okay? So I have, again, this kinetic energy term. I have the interaction term. And I want to, to write uh, uh, equation, ev evolution equation for this polariton field. So I do just the Eisenberg equation. I h bar d psi over dt is equal to psi commutator with h. Okay? You can calculate this commutator, and you end up with this equation here, which maybe you recognize. Sorry, I was there. Yeah. Maybe you recognize it's actually uh, it, It's a gross pitayevsky type of equation, okay? I d psi over dt is equal to h bar squared over 2m, uh, grade squared of psi plus the interaction term, okay? And I told you that we want to work now in a regime where we have a lot of photons, okay? So if we have a lot of photons, we can do an approximation where we are going to replace basically all the field operators by, by their average uh, value uh, in uh, a state macroscopically occupied state, psi, okay? So I just replace the operators by operators between brackets here. I get this equation, okay? And the mean field approximation consists in saying that this product here is going to be the product of the mean values, okay? And if I do that, well, now I end up with the actual time-dependent gross pitayevsky equation that you probably have already encountered, okay? We are driven dissipative again, so I was just writing here the equation for, uh, by forgetting about the drive and the dissipation. In fact, for our system, we need a generalized version of this gross pitayevsky equation, and it writes as such, we have the i d psi over dt, and then we have here the kinetic energy term, the interaction term, u times n, the density of polaritons over h bar. I add here a phenomenological term which accounts for the dissipation, so it's an imaginary term, minus i gamma over 2, gamma is the photon loss term, okay? And I account for the driving field by adding this i f, f is the laser field. Okay, so the equation in the end writes as such. Uh, let's look at the steady state equations of, of this equation, uh, the, the steady state solution of this equation, okay? So, we consider a driving field that is like this, F naught exponential i kpr minus omega pt. So kp is the wave vector of the pump, okay? So we may be pumping the sample with some k angle, fine. Omega p is the uh, energy, the, the frequency of the pump. And we search for solution of this form, psi steady state exponential i kp dot r minus omega t. Now, in the completely linear regime, it's really easy to do it. Huh? Uh, you, 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 you replace and, uh, uh, psi by this, this formula. 
and you search for the modulus square of psi, and what you end up with is a Lorentzian function with a line width, gamma, the line width of your cavity mode. So this means that if I take a pump laser here with, let's say, k equals zero, that's what I drew, and I vary the energy of the pump, I will get the following response. I get a Lorentzian as a function of the pump energy, and where, when the laser energy is equal to the energy of my lower polariton mode, I have maximum transmission and I have a Lorentzian. This is totally linear physics. Actually, if I go and I sit here, I put the frequency of the pump at the maximum transmission and I increase the power, I get a linear function. Again, linear physics, so fine. Let's add the nonlinear term now. If I add the nonlinear term, you do the same process. You inject your steady-state uh, steady state solution into the equation. You search for the solution. And what you will see is it writes almost like before. It's almost this Lorentzian form, OK? Except that this term here now writes as omega naught plus g times n. g is the interaction. It used to be u. I call it g from now on, sorry. Uh, and uh, n is the number of lower polaritons. Okay, so this is the total interaction energy. And you see that somehow it means that the interaction has kind of shifted the energy of your lower polariton mode to the blue because we have repulsive interactions. Right, so of course, I mean, in the equation, you see an NP appears multiple times. So you have this third order polynomial equation that you need to solve. It's easy. You search for the solutions. You find as a function <coughs> for instance, of the frequency of the pump, you find three solutions, third order polynomial, you have three solutions for NP that you can plot. I only keep, of course, the real solutions because NP is, NLP is a number uh, uh, of polaritons, so I only keep the uh, real solutions, and I have this. So I don't find this Lorentzian anymore. The Lorentzian is a little bit tilted, and a little bit tilted towards the higher energies, so towards the blue, meaning that, I mean, this is this blue shift that I was describing to you. Okay, so the, the effect of the, the interaction is the following. You start in the linear regime with a Lorentzian line like that, and now you increase the power, and if you increase the power, instead of having just the same Lorentzian at a higher power, it's going to be like this. Okay, it's going to tilt and to shift. Bon. Um, what you notice also is like at this point here, for these kind of ranges, I have in fact three solutions. This is possible because I have a third order polynomial. So I have three solutions that exist simultaneously. So this is called multi-stability. We are going to talk about that in the moment. Now imagine that you start in the linear regime do it again. I start with a Lorentzian like this and I use my pump laser. I, I put it for instance at k equals zero but at this energy. Okay. So when I am at really low power I inject really badly the system. It's really in the tail of the Lorentzian so the number of photons is low. Most of the photons are reflecting. Some of them go inside but little by little as I increase the power I build up a polariton population, and so the line is going to start shifting like this. And then at some point, it will reach the energy of the pump. And so what we are going to see here, if I plot as the number of polaritons as a function of the drive power, we are going to see a huge jump all of a sudden when this arrives at resonance with the pump. We slowly, slowly, slowly increase in a nonlinear fashion. We are really in the nonlinear uh, uh, regime here. We slowly, slowly increase the population because we are able to inject little by little. But since things move at the same time, at some point, up we jump to a much higher population. And then if I bring down the pump, I will stay on this line and do that. So I will see some hysteresis, some bistability kind of behavior. We can characterize actually the stability of the solutions. And to characterize the stability of the solutions here, I mean, we need to do something which is uh, very uh, useful uh, and, and uh, how to say, uh, uh, used very much in, in, in physics, which is 
you are going to start from the steady state solution. Okay? So I know that I have n, my, my steady state solution, I know that I have n polaritons, so the amplitude is square root of n Lp times some exponential of minus omega Pt. Okay? And I want to see a small perturbation like small, I, I'm going to search solution under this form. I, I, I use this ansatz, like what kind of excitation can live on top of this nonlinear steady state, okay? So I start with this, and I start just for a small delta psi, exponential minus i k r minus omega pt. So I can inject this again into the gross pitayevsky equation. I use the fact that this is a steady state solution of the system, and I end up with the following equation for delta psi, where I only keep the first order terms here, okay? <coughs> this is what I obtain. And the trick that is done usually when you do bubble buffer analysis is that you see that in this equation that I just got, you have delta psi, but you have also a delta psi star somewhere. So what you do is you take the complex conjugate of this equation, and now you get, for these two equations, you can write a first order, a linearized equation, first order equation, for this vector, delta psi, delta psi star, with a matrix here that is called the Bogolubov matrix, which is a little bit different by the, from the one you, you know usually because there is a dissipation here. But this is uh, just a, a, a side remark. So the equation write as such. It is a linear equation. It's the first order differential equation. So the solutions are going to be a uh, linear combination of exponential terms minus i times the eigenvalues of this Bogolubov matrix. And so what we can conclude from this is that if some of the eigenvalues of the Bogolubov matrix have a positive imaginary part, then we are going to diverge because we are going to have a term in exponential lambda t with lambda positive, so the solutions are going to diverge, and these are unstable solutions, okay? So let's go back to this graph here. I suppose that I work at really low, low power here, so I, I work at this power, and I look at uh, the, the, these eigenvalues of the Bogolubov matrix, okay? So what I see is the following. Uh, I consider that I have a pump, at k equals zero, at this energy. So the zero of energy here is defined by the energy of the pump, okay? So we, but we are at really low power, so if you want somehow the steady state that we have is vacuum. And we are looking at excitation on top of this vacuum state. And so what we find is basically if we look at the, um, the real part of the Bergoglio spectrum, we find a parabola which is basically the dispersion of the polaritons in the linear regime. So these are the excitations on top of vacuum, if you want. And by construction of the Bogolubov matrix, you know, I, we, I, we introduced this delta psi, delta psi star. Uh, we have also the symmetric with respect to zero. So we have these two parabolas. But the message is like, okay, we have one parabola, which is basically the linear spectrum of, uh, of the polaritons. And also the imaginary part is negative, so we are stable, okay? Fine. If we go to the... Um, high power regime, I go there, I can do the same thing, I calculate the, the I calculate, sorry, I'm lost, yes, I calculate the uh, Bogolubov um, spectrum for, on top of this steady state. Again, the pump, energy of the pump is there, and I find a parabola, and this parabola is now shifted by some energy, okay, it has shifted by some energy, and this is basically this interaction blue shift that I was telling you about. So on top of this steady state, if you look, the dispersion of the polaritons is going to be a parabola, which is shifted, okay? The imaginary part, again, is negative. So this means that this solution is also stable. If I go in the middle here, in this branch, I can calculate again the Bogolubov excitation spectrum. Alors the, the, the real part, the energy spectrum, looks a little bit uh, weird here, the, this... Uh, this uh, eigenvalues collapse to zero, and at this point, actually, the imaginary part becomes positive, okay? So when we are on the, the middle branch here of this, we have actually an unstable solution, and this goes back to what I was saying before, that 
we are going to have some bi-stability, uh, kind of bi-stable kind of behavior. And this has been observed in the early 2000s. The idea is you go into your planar cavity, okay? You come, let's say, with a k equals zero. The pump is shown here, normal to the surface at k equals zero, with some energy detuning, okay? And we are uh, de uh, pumping at an energy which is uh, higher than the lower polariton energy. And then we increase the power. So initially, the, the polariton injection is really low because we are not resonant with anything, and so it increases slowly. And all of a sudden, when the interactions are strong <coughs> enough to shift the polaritons by the sufficient energy, you jump up, you go to a different state, and then you can come back, and you have this kind of uh, hysteresis cycle that opens. So this is like a typical nonlinear uh, effect that we see on our, on our cavities, uh, which is like this bistability. And actually, it has been shown that uh, polaritons, in fact, uh, show also superfluid uh, behavior in this kind of situation. If we go to a very, very particular point here, so in the upper branch of the bistability, we go to the point just before we jump down. Okay? We are going to sit on that point here. And I'm going to plot, again, the Bogolubov spectrum of excitations for the system. And it looks like that. So the energy of the pump, again, we are pumping at k equals zero. The energy of the pump is here. And you see that at this point, you have a Bogolubov spectrum that shows here a linear behavior at small k, and then recovers a kind of parabolic behavior at high k. So what is important is like around this k equals zero, the small k, when you do the, the, uh, the when you write the, the dispersion and you do the expansion around k equals zero, you found the linear behavior, you find a, a linear behavior, which means that the photon has this phonon-like dispersion relation at this point with the speed of sound, which is obtained according to the interaction energy divided by the mass of the lower polaritons, okay? And so this is the kind of the uh, dispersion uh, a relation that uh, may ring a bell to you because this is what uh, you expect in a, the case of a superfluid, uh, this kind of sound-like dispersion. At this particular point, what is important to see is that there is a zero density of states, so there are no available states for the fluid to, um, uh, to experience some scattering, okay? So this was actually tested experimentally in 2009 and they said, people said, okay, let's create a flow of polaritons. Okay, so we inject the polaritons with an angle, K angle, like this. They are going to flow in one direction. And we are going to make them flow against a defect. Usually when you do the growth of your sample, you can have structural defects in your sample. So you can say, okay, let's go through the defect and see what happens. They started in the linear regime. So you, you excite at a K here, you see like this, this hello dot represents where you excite. So you excite at a given K to, to, to make a flow of polaritons and slightly detuned from the blue line, which is the linear polariton dispersion, okay? As I was telling you, at low power, basically the Bogolubov dispersion, the, the, the spectrum of excitation uh, above the vacuum is basically your linear dispersion. So you see that at the energy of the pump, you have plenty of states available to experience elastic scattering. So when the polaritons flow is going to encounter the defect, they are going to scatter, and there are many, many states available at the same energy to scatter. So what people saw when they sent a flow of polaritons against the defect, the defect is here, there is the flow of the polaritons, they saw that indeed there is some scattering. So if you look at the real space image Due to the scattering, you have uh, this kind of interference, interference fringes here that appear, okay? And due to the elastic scattering on these points of the dispersion, and you need to imagine that, I mean, I just plot a parabola, but this is a full paraboloid, huh? it's 3D. So you can actually scatter on a ring here in case space. So this is a case space image. This is the defect. Uh, the exc excitation spot, sorry, and this is the elastic scattering ring that is observed in the experiment. Now, if you increase the power and you go into the nonlinear regime, 
you encounter this super this this kind of uh, dispersion that I just showed you. Alors now it's a little bit tilted because I put an angle. Hein, I told you we, we want a, a flow of polariton, so there is an angle, and because of that. Uh, well, you still have this sonic behavior, but slightly tilted. And you see that at this point here, when you reach this level, the, there are no states available to do uh, scattering. So when the polariton flow encounters the defect, you see a very strong difference here in the behavior. There is no modulation of the density here, because there is no scattering, and there is no elastic scattering ring here. And so this is actually the superfluid behavior of light. Okay? That's what people were, uh, were able to show. Okay. Um, alors, uh, let me think for two seconds what I'm doing now. Um, I just want to, uh, I, I will not have time for, uh, to go through the, this full thing. I wanted to show you some. Uh, uh, some ex uh, recent experiment where we looked basically at these interactions, what I just described to you. I described two important effects, which are multi-stability uh, for nonlinear polariton fluid. And also, I wanted to explain to you like the concept about this Bogolubov excitation spectrum. Okay? And all I discussed at the moment were in a planar cavity. And I wanted to talk to you about uh, very recent, it got published actually this week, very rec recent experiment that we did in a lattice, in a 1D lattice. I don't have time to go so much through uh, the, 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 the context actually, but I, I, I just want to show you the kind of lattice that we used. So we used a 1D chain here, 1D chain of pillars, okay? And you see, if you look carefully at this image that these two pillars, they are closer than these ones, okay? So there is a modulation in the hopping. We can change the hopping. So there is like here a strong overlap, less strong overlap. So strong hopping, less strong hopping. And so this lattice has a very particular dispersion because of this modulation here. You have, if you want, you have two sides per unit cell. And when you look at the band structure, you have two S bands with a gap in the middle, okay? You have a gap here, and then you have two S-bands. This, for people who may have heard about it, is called the SSH chain. And what we looked at is some nonlinear effect in this SSH chain. Okay? Um, the, the idea is very similar to uh, what I discussed just now. Imagine that you take a pump here, you take your laser, and you focus it on two sides of the lattice here at an energy which is in the middle of the gap. Originally, you have strictly no polaritons that are excited <coughs> because you are not resonant with anything. And our idea was to say, OK, if we increase enough the power, at some point, we will be able to shift two sides of the lattice here, place them on resonance with the, the pump, and then create a hole, if you want. We create a hole in the lattice. So we create an interface of light uh, in the lattice. And these actually are excitations, nonlinear excitation, that are called solitons or gap solitons. Why they are called solitons? Because, I mean, if you have heard about solitons in, in uh, the context of uh, wave mechanics, these are uh, waves that do not uh, disperse over time. And these uh, waves here, they are self-sustained, if you want, by the drive. The drive is exciting them. These are shifting these two pillars. And as long as the drive is on, the pump is on, uh, it will not move, it will just stay there, okay? So I'll, I'll just show you that, and then we, we, can, we can conclude that uh, indeed also on the lattice, uh, we can increase the power here, and we see this kind of uh, hysteretic behavior, okay? We measure this hysteretic behavior, uh, where when we are in this branch of this uh, hysteresis cycle, we excite a localized solution. It's a localized solution here. Uh, you see like this dimer here brights up, it brights up, and uh, it shows that we have shifted it and created this kind of uh, soliton excitation. This is a nonlinear ex excitation in the lattice. And so we have been playing uh, around with this kind of uh, excitation in the lattice. So this is at the mean field level still. Huh? We are in the gross pitayevsky kind of context, but this shows you the kind of nonlinear physics. It's nonlinear Bozubard or driven physics that we can do uh, in 
uh, in, in the context of uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, lattices in the mean field regime. I will now, I promise to you that at the end, I will come back to some perspective for uh, quantum polytonics because I showed you that uh, this u over gamma uh, term is for the moment too low. Okay, we have u over gamma of the order of 0 0.1 and we would like to reach the quantum regime where u over gamma is of the order or larger than 1. Okay? Yeah. And there are many parameters we can uh, change to try to optimize this. I choose one to show you like one idea that uh, uh, we, can, we can do to, to try to go further into the quantum regime. And the idea here is to uh, play a little bit on the active material, okay? So until now, I de described as an active material for you just a single quantum well in which you create electron roll pairs, okay? We can be a little bit more fancy and we can work with, for instance, two quantum wells here, two coupled quantum wells. This is something that is easy to do during the growth. And one of the, uh, the, the, the visions that we have is that, okay, if we put two quantum wells on top of each other with a slight, only a slight barrier in the middle, we can manage to work in a situation where, if you want, we will address optically this quantum well. We create an exciton here, electron hole pair, and the hole will be confined in one of the quantum wells, whereas the electron, if you find the proper conditions for your band, in your band structure engineering, the electron can tunnel from one uh, quantum well to the other, okay? So the electron is actually a delocalized state between quantum well one and qu quantum well two here. And so you have an electron hole pair where the electron is here and the hole is kind of oscillating between two quantum wells. And so this is a possibility, a solution that you have to kind of polarize the exciton. Huh? Excitons are polarizable particles. They have an electron and a an hole. And because of that, we won't have just this kind of Coulomb contact interaction that I described earlier, but you can also add an extra term, which is a dipole-dipole term in the interaction. So that is one of the ideas that we are following to try to optimize uh, interactions. We are not the only ones to do that, actually. Uh, in fact, uh, in the group of Atachi Mamoglu, uh, they have done such experiments in 2018 in the planar cavity, and they have shown that uh, when you do this kind of structures and you work with this kind of coupled quantum wells, and you see that here the dispersion starts to become a bit more complex because it's not only uh, exciton-photon interaction, but there are more terms to account for. But at least they showed that the interaction can be enhanced by a factor allez, five to seven. And at the same time, they observed the reduction of the, of, of the limit by the factor two or three. So if we, if, if we take into account these numbers, you can see that there is a, a, a good room for optimization in terms of this U over gamma term going into the quantum regime. So with that, I am actually finished. So this is like the, the, my last slide about like the general vision of uh, where, where this is going. So we are going to try to push these nonlinearities, this U over gamma term, to go in the quantum regime in order to be able to implement, as I described during the first hour, some driven dissipative Bose-Hubbard physics in 1D, 2D lattices. Uh, and one of the visions that I, I, I showed you through this uh, theory paper from Caruso and Jacopo and, uh, and uh, Imamoglu is the idea of, well, you can use any kind of lattice, square lattice, 1D lattice, through the pump, uh, you will excite different, like in, in the Bosubart configuration, you, you will be able to realize uh, temporal and spatial correlations and create uh, uh, quantum states of light coming out of your lattice. That is what I describe here by this, this kind of model. And yeah, so this is uh, one of the ideas that we have for the, for the future. And with that, I'm going to stop and thank you for your attention. Um, we can very easily go to, let's say, 10 by 10, like even 30 by 30. This is really not a limitation in the sense that uh, through nanofabrication, we can do 
very large lattices. Then there are limitations that are related to inhomogeneities that may appear during the fabrication. For instance, if you start doing like a 30 sites lattice, the, the, the lattice site is of the order of three microns, so you will go of the order of mm, like a few hundred microns, and then you start having inhomogeneities in the cavity. For instance, if the mirrors are not totally parallel, but a little bit uh, uh, tilted, you get a gradient. Not all your sites are the same energy, it causes problem. Um, you may have a bit of disorder. So uh, there are, uh, but these are things that on the fabrication side and on the technological side, we, we have some room uh, to, to, to work on actually. And so in terms of scaling, we are not uh, too much limited. For the moment, the biggest limitation is really this interaction. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. In the Bogolubov matrix, this is what it is. And it gives you some uh, indication of the, 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 the stability of the solution. It's really due to, I mean, this, this term has been introduced in the, at the beginning of the, the second lecture. It has been introduced by hands, if you want, kind of phenomenologically to take into account the, the, the dissipation in the cavity. So, of course, then it just follows up in the rest of the calculation. It's there. Yeah. Yes. It's, it is indeed the photon loss through the cavity. So in the end, the polariton, when you excite them, the, 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 the decay channel that they have is, uh, is the, the, the cavity, uh, the, the photon lifetime. So we are limited by the photon lifetime in the cavity. And if we manage to optimize the quality factor, we can push a little bit the, the, the lifetime. So is it radiation loss or what, what is the limiting factor? Pardon me, you say? Uh, what is the limiting factor of your cavity? Alors, yeah, okay, so the, well, there is first uh, the reflectivity of the mirror, okay? So you could try to push more and more the reflectivity of the mirror by adding up more Bragg layers into your mirror. Uh, however, at some point, you are also limited by residual absorption in the, in the in semiconductor material. So there is a trade-off there to find between what kind of reflectivity you want for your mirrors and what kind of level of absorption you have in the cavity, okay? If you have it's at some point useless to add more pairs if you have absorption because the photon will bounce, bounce, bounce and get absorbed. So you don't want that. So that's, that's the, 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 the trade-off that we have. At the moment, we work with 10 to the 5 kind of quality factors. There may be some ways to work with different materials or different quantum wells at slightly lower energies, for instance, where you will decrease the absorption loss. There are, there are some things that we can do, but uh, there is always this limitation, yeah. All right, I think we should stop here, so thank you very much, Sylvain. <laughs>
It's just like, I see. And then this one as well. And this one as well. Oh my god. I'm really getting wired up. Okay. Okay, so you can hear me, everything sounds all right? Okay, great. Now, uh, present of you, like this guy, if I go this thing over here. Hey, hey. Ooh. Oh, hang on, now this is actually now. How do I make this full screen? No, that's my thick mark list. Oh, what happened? Okay. I just killed it. <laughs> Alright, let's just press that. Okay. Very good. And what time should I finish? It's one hour sharp. Okay. Sharp, you will shoot me if I go over. Sharp plus or minus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 it's not a problem. I've already signed, yeah. Okay, so an hour sharp, but uh, as judged by that clock, I'll, I'll just record it on here. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I'll just, I'll just record it on here. Yeah, no, no, of course, of course. Sure, sure. All right. So fourth company, and the big company. All right. Thanks very much for the introduction. Um, so, hi, everyone. I, I understand that I am uh, standing in between you and lunch, which is a terrible crime. Um, but uh, with, with that being said, I have a bunch of slides. I very much, you know, honestly doubt that uh, I'm going to get through all of them just because I'm always ambitious when I'm putting together slides. I'd much rather get through less slides and convey more information than get through more than, than you know, skip through a bunch of slides and leave you just walking out with glazed eyes. Please uh, ask any questions. Um, yeah, please ask any questions possible because honestly, Really, the, the stupider the question, usually the more useful it actually is to ask it. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to cover three things today. The first thing I'm just going to go over is like kind of a brief, you know, the piece about who we are at Google and where we are and, and etc. Um, I've got a little bit of a couple of slides on superconducting qubits, but I'm not an experimentalist. I think most people in the audience are, so you probably know more about superconducting qubits than I do, to be honest. Um, and also, you've had a couple of lectures previously on superconducting qubits, so. I've, I've skimmed over a couple of the details there. Uh, what I'm going to cover in detail is I understand you've had a little bit of a t uh, just, um, talk on error correction, but I'm going to go into error correction because it's kind of very central to the efforts of uh, Google. Um, it's probably, I think, 80% of our effort is in error correction. Um, and then I'm going to finish off because I'm actually one of the 20%. I, I, don't, do it, I don't do any work on error correction. Um, and I'm going to focus, finish, instead of talking about error correction, talking about error mitigation. So it's like algorithm, uh, algorithmic ideas to try to push you in like the last the last hundred mi the last hundred yards in the sprint towards a, you know, a result that's actually worth you know, publishing and getting excited over. Um, without further ado, let me begin. Oh, if this thing wants to work, okay. So here's the team. Um, this is a very 2022 uh, team photo or 2020 team photo from uh, from COVID times. I don't think everyone is in uh, from the team is, is in here. We're, we're over 100 people by now. We are also growing quite quickly. Um, I should have put a link up here to, to our, our careers page. But if you go to Google, like quantumai.google.com, I think that's the right web, website, then you'll, you, you'll find quick links to all of our, um, all of our current job postings. Uh, it's all online. If you have any other questions about that, then please come and feel free to come and ask me after the, after the talk. Uh, we like to split, actually this slide's a bit old, we like to split up um, our team into roughly five parts, although that's very, very, like the bottom half of it is honestly like much larger than everything else. Uh, and this also gives you an idea about where we're based. So it's a bit old because now, so applications development now takes place in Munich, Los Angeles, and also in San Francisco. We've got uh, two people in the office up there. Um, and, to, and so that, that's all, you know, this is quantum algorithms and applications, this is what I do. And it's all about trying to find out what we could do with a quantum computer, either with the stuff that we're going to have now or the things that we hope to have in 10 years' time, which I'll get to in a few later slides. Um, then the majority of our, then, sorry, then the majority of our effort is spread across two offices. There is a Santa Barbara office where all of our hardware is located. 
and this kind of spread throughout the city um, because you know the the quantum team at Google mostly grew out of the, the group of UCSB and then we also have a very large presence in Los Angeles in, in like in the Venice in the Venice Beach office and that's where most of our I would say more than 50 percent of our theorists lie so um, and, and so then the theorists in, this, in the Los Angeles office, they work on like our development environment, CERC. Some of you may have used it. It's our tool for developing quantum circuits, manipulating quantum circuits, simulating quantum circuits, and actually running them on the device. Um, CERC sits on top of, uh, so CERC sits on top then of like, of, of kind of two somewhat separate but very interlinked methods of accessing the device. We have our quantum, our, our cloud, uh, quantum computing service, or known as, also known as Quantum Engine. This is developed a little bit out of Seattle uh, from, from Dave Bacon, but also um, is, is based in Santa Barbara. And this all sits on top of like our Quantum OS, which is called Pile, which is not like externally accessible, but this is kind of where the magic happens. This is like the stuff that actually interacts with the device. And then on the level below that, where well, we have all of our hardware, which is constructed in these offices here. This is a picture of Santa Barbara. You can see the airport right down the middle. I don't know how many of you have actually been there. Um, but oh, you know, we, we've, uh, this is, this is where, where, where the magic happens. And so the, the group started actually in our building, we call them GQ2 for Google Quantum. Uh, we started over here in, in the, the, um, the offices that were bought from UCSB. That was where our Beyond Classical Experiment in 2019 was done. In, uh, then, then over the course of the pandemic, we actually opened two new offices, which are already kind of starting to fill out of people. We've opened a process of fabrication lab in the, around the same areas. And then also if you come over here, then you have our quantum AI headquarters, which is based in, down, well, it's, not, not, it's still in downtown Galletta, I guess, mainly. And then the Univer University of Santa Barbara is actually over here. Um, so that's the, and this is, this is a, a shot of our, um, of our lab. If you ever get the chance to stop by, I would highly recommend it because it's, it's been kind of, you know, art decoed out in a bit more of the, the Google style than, than the average lab. We like to paint things. We like to paint our fridges with uh, fun colors. Um, and and uh, the building contains a lot of like, you know, history of our quantum journey that's happened over the last 10 years. Highly worth a visit. Would recommend if you're in Santa Barbara. Um, so what do we work on? So I, what I actually don't, what I actually can't do, or what, what I what I don't have access to, probably they, they may well exist, but I just don't know which ones I can use. Is, is actually photographs of our device, but superconducting qubits honestly like almost always look the same, and they have very very similar components. So I've just stolen a picture because my as well as being uh, part of Google, I'm actually a guest I'm actually a guest faculty at Leiden University, which is where I've done a lot of my work with uh, with groups in Delft, and so I've stolen a, pic a picture from the QTech blog of Chris Dickel, which gives, in my opinion, a very good description of a superconducting qubit, and it's relatively similar to the qubits that we use. Um, you probably know more. I, I've said before, you probably know more about this than I do, but. You know, we have a superconducting film, so you take, I think, substrate of sapphire, I'm not 100% sure. You lay a superconductor on top of that, and then you etch that away to make funny, fun patterns that turn out to look a lot like, um, you know, harmonic oscillators with slight um, harmonicity as generated by this squid loop. Um, this works in a regime which is about five, five gigahertz is your gap. You can uh, adjust this by, you, you, sorry, you can adjust this by tuning the amount of current that's going through your flux bias line. We use we use tunable couplers. Not everyone that works in superconducting qubits uses tunable, um, uses tunable super, um, sorry, tunable qubits. Um, but we do. Then we have microwave cavities for our single qubit gates. And then if you want to connect two qubits, you do so by literally connecting them by a microwave resonator. And then you know you you just tune them in in frequency, and then you'll drive on site on site reaction uh, on site uh, like a, a qubit qubit interaction. Um, one thing that we do at Google that's not done in Delft, or at least when last I checked and done in Delft, maybe they've changed, is that we also use tunable couplers, which is where you kind of have an intermediary qubit in the way that you can use to turn on and off your interaction, like a, a longer range interaction. Um, yeah, so microwave, you have microwave control for single qubit gates. Two qubits, we have no microwaves for our two qubit gates. They're just controlled by a tunable coupler in between and by, by changing the frequency by, by driving your current through the flux bias line. Um, our gate times, depending on the gate, they are actually our two qubit gates are quite fast. I think we have two qubits that are often like, uh, say, 8 to 20 nanoseconds. Single qubit gates are a little bit slower. They're about 40 nanoseconds. Our readout time is about 4 microseconds. And our repetition rate, usually we're getting about 4,000 samples. That's 4,000 circuit executions per second. Um, actually, I think we can do a bit better than that. But all the numbers that I'm citing here are from our publicly available data sheet 
which is from one of the data, one of the um, processes that we were running through the quantum computing service uh, called the Weber processor. I've got some more um, data on that on the next slide. Um, one thing I want to emphasize, I mean, this is true of all quantum computers, uh, at least, you know, th those that aren't planned to be operated using, like, topological braiding means, but all quantum, computer, all, all quantum computers are not discrete devices. Everything that we do is actually continuous. This means that, you know, you need to make sure that your pulses are very finely tuned to kind of do the discrete thing that you want, and that when you stop them, they turn off. Of course, this is a problem. It's never, com it's never, never completely exact. And so this is one, like, definitely... Um, drift is one of our larger sources of error. And then all the other source of error, um, uh, probably one of the big source of error is like shot noise through that flux bias line, which just causes your gap to slowly fluctuate. Uh, accidental photon loss, otherwise known as T1. Unwanted coupling to anything that sits in the, in the neighborhood. Um, and yeah, control noise, drift. I think I've got some other, other examples of that on the next slide. Any questions about superconducting qubits before I move on? No, okay, this is probably not new to you. Oh, yeah, sorry. And the obvious thing is that we need to put this in our dilution refrigerator because one Kelvin is 20 gigahertz. So if I have an energy gap of 5 gigahertz and I don't want stray thermal excitations everywhere, I need to be far below 20 over 4, or like 1 Kelvin over 4. Great. So here is uh, some, this is like, as, as a theorist, this is kind of making me a lot more comfortable because now we're talking about, you know, abstracting a little bit away the, the, the physics of the problem and thinking more about like thinking about more this this more as a quantum processor. I also apologize because clearly the numbers on this slide you cannot see, but this is pulled directly from our spec sheet, the spec sheet that I just gave before of our Weber processor. This is actually the processor that was used to um, to do the Beyond Classical experiment in 2019. We then repurpose it for our quantum computing service. Been using it for a number of publications since. Um, and so I guess yeah, so what do I about. Yeah, so this is most, most of the state of the art. Oh, yeah, so this is probably the important numbers. Um, you know, when we think about, we like to think about this, or we don't like to think about quantum computers as if they were just, you know, like uh, gates with a single number of error, but it does make it a lot very, very convenient when you're analyzing like a 50 qubit chip to just have kind of one number per qubit or one number per gate to, to actually talk about. So the numbers that we, we have here, um, I don't think you can kind of see this, but this color bar goes up to uh, six percent next EB error, and so most of the numbers around here. This was like just taken on an arbitrary day. As you can see, some of our qubits can be very badly calibrated on any given day, but they can also be very, very good calibrated. Most of these numbers are around about you know one percent or less. When we tune this up fully for the Beyond Classical experiment, these are the numbers on the right, which was kind of this this uh, chip on a very, very good day because it's when someone's really paying attention to the tuning. Then you know our average isolated uh, two qubit gate error can be as low as like. 0.36 percent. So that's a that's a fidelity of about uh, what is that 99.6 99.64. Uh, when you make things simultaneous, obviously you get a lot of crosstalk and things just tend to be a bit harder to execute. And your two qubit gate fidelity drops on average to about zero point sorry 99.4 percent. Right, it's still quite good. Um, and then you know our our, our, our single qubit gates are, are lots uh, probably an order of magnitude better, and our readout is probably a factor of two or three worse. We can tolerate high readout error when it's only occurring at the end, but obviously as we, we push on, we're trying to get all of these numbers down. Um, and something that you know, is kind of true of all devices is that you know, on a 50 qubit device, these are the numbers you can get, but definitely in superconducting qubits, people have reported much higher numbers and especially higher numbers on smaller devices where you have less crosstalk and less of a calibration challenge. <coughs> oh, yes, please. <coughs> That is a good question. I think part of it is that our readout is, is four microseconds. Uh, so I think we have just have a lot of, uh, of noise due to T1 decay during readout. But I couldn't give you any more information than that. Um, there we go. I, I'm, I'm seeing nods from someone else. That's probably right. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely, please. Um, that's a good uh, a good question. So the square root of I swap gate was chosen in particular because it's very it, it is very hard to classically simulate, right? Um, also because I think so, you know when you when you drive your you drive your qubit to like resonance, right? And then you turn on your coupler and then suddenly have some interaction, which is a continuous interaction. You ramp this up, let it evolve for a certain amount of time, ramp it down. Now, I'm oh, sorry. <coughs> really sorry about that. That was really loud. Um, I really apologize. Um, yeah, so 
if you do that, then then you know, kind of like depending on the the coupling strength and everything, there is like a native or by tuning the, the the relative strength of the coupling, like the relative time you do this, you can kind of ex like you can execute any of what we call like a two qubit number number conserving excitation gate. Oh, sorry, excitation conserving gate, right? So anything that acts kind of does a rotation between zero one and one zero, and then does anything on your diagonal. Now, some gates are just kind of like easier to execute in like shorter time than others, and so the gates that were chosen is kind of like it's a balance between choosing gates that are short time on the device and like high fidelity on the device and kind of like at a nice point to, to access and then also being classically hard. And so square root iSwap here is, is actually harder to simulate than CZ because it has one more, I think the Schmidt decomposition is, is higher rank. That's the, the theorist term. Um, so yeah, so that's basically the balance there. I will say that in principle we could actually execute, yeah, any, any of these, any two qubit number conserving gate we can execute. Um, and in particular, like for, for the purposes of quantum error correction, which I'll get to shortly, uh, it turns out that C phase gates or CZ gates are, are just much more preferred. And so, um, so there we've, we've had a, a pretty strong focus on building CZs, but that's, yeah. <coughs> oh yeah, that's a good point. Well, I'm about, that's, that's what's written up here. So, and this is kind of a really, really critical point is that if, uh, if I want to do anything on the device, right, and I talk about, so we always talk about gate fidelities, but we want to run a circuit, and we want to run a circuit that I can't classically simulate, right? So if I, for me to classically simulate something, I'm, I need to have run it for like hundreds, if not thousands of gates. I mean, you've got the total number of gates that were executed in our 2019 experiment down here, right? And, and that was the number of gates that we needed to go to before we thought you could, before we couldn't simulate it on in the, the world's largest supercomputer at the time. Now, every single one of those gates compounds your fidelity, and it does so multiplicatively which is to say that the circuit fidelity is like one minus P, where P is my gate error, so you know, that's the gate fidelity, to the power of the number of gates. And so when you do that for, for this experiment, the predicted fidelity was the, is the predicted fidelity of the experiment by just using this formula, or like you know, product, taking the product over all of our individual gates. The extrapolated fidelity was what we saw down there, and you can see they match quite well, but you can also see that they're incredibly low. We're seeing, you know, about one in 500 experiments is actually succeeding. This is a problem for, for quantum computing in general. And so, you know, you either want to correct these or you want to mitigate these, but you need to do something about that if we want to push it any further. Because although it is probably necessary to like drive all of these error rates down by at least a fa factor of 10, if we want to do something, you know, kind of like go to large scale quantum computing and do something useful, we can't drive them down indefinitely. And if I drive down my fidelities by factor of 10, all I, or, like, or if I yeah, decrease my fidelity by a factor of 10, all I can do is like, make my circuits longer by a factor of 10, and that's not very much. So this is, this is the, the source of most of what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the talk. OK. <clears throat> and yeah, I think I mentioned, sorry, I mentioned this on the previous slide, so I'm just double, double you know, duplicating here. But yeah, decoherence and decay, control error, miscalibration. Part of the miscalibration is because all of the parameters drift a little bit, and obviously cross qubit qubit cross talk. Cool. Oh, and leakage as well. Okay. Without further ado, then let me tell you. Oh, do, are there any other questions about the experiment stuff before I move on? No. Great. Okay. Without further ado, let me move on to quantum error correction and teach you a little, tell you a little bit about how we plan to solve the error that we just described. Okay. I think I've just kind of like, yeah. The, I'm just going to rabbit on about the exact problem again in this slide. <laughs> Sorry about that. But this this kind of gives you an, an idea about. <clears throat> Sorry, something's wrong with my throat. I think I'm talking too much. Um, this probably gives you an idea, this gives you an idea about the, the issue that you face, right? Which is that, in principle, suppose I had a way of actually just detecting that an error occurred and throwing away that circuit. <clears throat> then, even if I can do something like that, which we, we aim to do with error mitigation, but we don't do it very, very well, once I, once I hit kind of roughly... Uh, the, a, a circuit which has the number of gates that's like one over my gate fidelity. If you go beyond there, then you quickly find that the number of times you have to throw away, the number of repetitions you have to run in order to actually see a circuit which passes just drops off exponentially and it drops off very quickly. So for instance, suppose that my gate fidelity was like 0 0.001, which we're kind of like nearing with today's de devices. This means that running a circuit which is like 100 qubits, perfectly fine. A thousand qubits. This is where this is where precisely you get one over e, in like the number of uh, the number of um, 
is, is sorry, is your success rate is one over E. But already by the time I've gotten to ten to the four, this has kind of really dropped off the map. And by the time you get like to you know three, uh, sorry, thirty thousand, this is at ten to the minus fifteen circuit fidelity. So that's just completely useless. You know, you can't, you can't, you will never see a success at this point. So this this kills the exponential speed up that we get from quantum computing. We need to find a way around that. And the way we have around this is is, is error correction. So error correction works in a very short, uh, so error correction is not unique to quantum computers. You need to error correct classical computers as well. Not Typically not your laptop, but for instance, when you're connecting to Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, or even when you're typing, even when you're actually um, putting in your, entering your credit card into a website, we have to do error correction. Not error correction on the computer, but error correction of your hands. Um, because your, and your, your credit card contains a checksum, which is why uh, you know, every time you type, mistype your, your, um, your card number into the, the, the internet, it actually can figure that out for you. Um, but yeah, so anyway, <coughs> sorry about that. To, to error correct, uh, regardless whether you're doing quantum or classical error correction, the way you do error correction is following. Firstly, you let yourself accumulate errors. And in particular here, you let you, you, you cut up the circuit that you're trying to run into a bunch of smaller circuits, and I accumulate errors only over that small circuit. Okay, then you probe the system to diagnose what the errors are occurred, and here you have to make the assumption that you can diagnose the errors, and this is where things get difficult. And then thirdly, you can do one of two things. You either correct the errors by inverting them, which is typically what you do classically, because it's very easy to do classical operations, or the other one, and this is what we probably will do for quantum computing, is you keep track of the errors, and you, you then at some point you have to do the correction before, because you'll need to be in the correct code space. You do the correction, correction and then you move on. OK? So this is a very, this is a very, um, a very common protocol. And it's also you can kind of get an idea about why this works, right? Because if I go back to the previous, if you think about the previous exponential decay curves, what's happening now is it's not that I, I'm, I'm getting like an exponent. Uh, it's not like I'm waiting for, I'm not like running the entire circuit and then waiting and, 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 and saying, OK, did I succeed or not? I'm running short parts of the circuit. I'm catching the exponential decay before it really tails off correcting things, and I let it evolve a bit further, and then I catch the exponential decay before it tails off. OK? Great. Now, oh yeah, and then the important thing is, how do we actually get a measure of, of how well we've done? Well, what I can do is I can say, OK, you know, I, I run my code. I've stored some data. I mean, you can also say I've stored and then I've operated on some data if you want to get really, really fancy. But I get to the end, and now, assumably, we do something simple because we're trying to measure the, 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 the success of the experiment. And so then we just measure. Um, what is the probability that I fail with my error correction protocol over the top? Nice and simple? Great. Let's move on. And let's now see how all of these steps might actually occur in a, in a classical code. Because I want to start with a classical error correction, classical error correction code, because it's kind of a bit easier to understand. And then I'm going to move on to quantum error correction, and then we'll hopefully see like, where, some of the, um, where some of the issues lie. Oh, good. I've got 40 more minutes. There's plenty of time. So the repetition code is probably the simplest classical error correction code because it, it says it in the name. Now, um, the idea is, so, so, you know, so let's start off with what, what, what a device looks, or what, a, what my, my bit of information looks like if it's not encoded. I'm going to try to, then, and the game I'm trying to do now is not to do any computation. All I want to do is encode a single bit of information. Nice and simple. So I take an x. It's either 0 or 1, because it's one bit. And then after some time, with probability p, it is flipped. And with probability 1 minus p, it is not flipped. Great, OK. Now my, and, and so that means that then I succeed. For, as you remember from my pre previous slide, step four, I succeed when you know, it hasn't flipped and I fail when it's flipped. I mean, this is simple. Um, so that's unencoded. Now let me encode. Oh, uh, yeah, sorry, I said the fa failure rate is p. Great. When I encode now, uh, it's a repetition code. I just repeat. I just copy x three times. OK? Copy x three times. And now my code space is either 0, 0, 0, or 1, 1, 1. Now, if I assume that everything is completely stochastic, so like errors are uncorrelated, then you know, the probability of nothing happening, it's going to be 1 minus p cubed. That's actually bad. right? This is, this is strictly worse than just 1 minus p. But the probability of having, say, just one bit flip occur, well, I'm, I'm assuming that like, it's either that one or this one or this one. Just you know, I don't want to like, write down all eight combinations on a slide. So this has probability 3 for the three, the three combinations times p times 1 minus p squared. You know, and, and you can compete, do the binomial probabilities of doing the other, the other ones. OK, great. So that gives me four things that could come out of here, up to permutation. Um, and so now the, the thing that I have to do is I have to declare success of some of them and failure on the others, right? And so the way that I would, I would unencode this 
is I would just do a majority vote. I'd just say, okay, if I see 0, 0, 1, I assume that the thing I'd started with was 0, because that's more likely than having 1 and doing, taking two flips. Great. This splits us into two categories. And so now my failure rate is no longer p. It's this, this number here, 3p squared times 1 minus p plus p cubed, which is the sum of this guy and this guy. Great. Um, <coughs> sorry. Ah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That'd be fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'd forgotten to bring a bottle when I came in. Ah, oh, so much better. Thank you. OK. Um, yeah, fantastic. OK, so there's my failure rate, 3p squared times 1 minus p plus p. And so now the question is, have I done better than, than if I didn't encode? OK. And we can check this. Um, and to check this, well, let's set them equal and solve for p. To do that, you find that, and you find that the number p at which point this thing on the left is actually small and this thing on the right is actually 50%. Okay, great. So this is what you call a pseudo threshold. Um, and the idea is that every, time that every time that my error rate is less than 50%, I'm improving my error rate by, by, doing, this, by doing this code. Okay? Now, what do I say? Now, I should point out that 50% is actually kind of as high as you could possibly imagine. Because if I had an error rate that was higher than 50%, I would gain by just flipping my bit on top of this, right? Like sending p to not p as well would, would actually improve me. So 50% is the best you can do, and it's also the best you need to do, which is good. OK, so yeah, so there are two, now there are two, there are two different thresholds. There's a pseudo threshold and a threshold, two different concepts. They're almost the same thing, they're slightly different. The pseudo threshold is the thing that I just described. The threshold is the idea, is the idea that, you know, I just, I just did like a one bit encoding to three bits. But I could do this on 5, I could do this on 7, I can do this on 9, I can do this on any odd number. You want to do it on odd numbers because if I do even numbers, then there's one case where like half the bits are flipped, which is unclear. I don't know what that does, and so that's kind of a failure as well. Um, yeah, and so the, the threshold is a point below, and, and so the idea is that as I go and make this larger and larger and larger, when do I hit a point where kind of I can make my error rate as small as possible um, with only like a, a, a small uh, polynomial resources? And something to note here as well, um, yeah, and something to see here is when I talk about it being exponentially small, we, so the, these are actually just the, the, the failure rates of these different codes, right? And you can see that I go from p to the leading order p squared to leading order p cubed to leading order p fourth and so on and so forth. So this means that my, my, error, my logical error rate is decreasing exponentially in the code distance. That's great, that's what we want, okay? If I can get, uh, if I can, kill my logical error rate exponentially, I can maintain an exponential advantage on a quantum computer. Okay? And the threshold is the point at which you can do that. Now, classical error correction codes, and in fact I've just shown one, have pseudo thresholds and thresholds of 50%. Okay? Quantum error correcting codes do not. And this is one of the big problems that we face when we go to do quantum error correction. All right, so that was the, that's the error, that is the, um, that's not the only problem we face when we go to quantum error correction. Let me move to here and let me try to like, over, like I'm just going to give you an overview of what's going to go wrong when I try to take this code and I try to make, I try to quantize it, right? I try to make it a quantum code. Now, the first problem is just one like that's physical nature that everyone in this room kind of like has to deal with is that yeah, quantum computers are really noisy. So your class, I think the, the rate of failure of a classical bit is something like 10, one in 10 to the minus 12 operations and it's driven by, um, uh, by high energy like cosmic particles. So that's, that's, like a, that's a nice number. We have something like error rates of 10 to the minus 3. Um, uh, yeah, 10 to the minus 14 was the classical one. Okay. The second problem we have is, and I'll, uh, I'll expand on this in detail on the next slide, is that measuring a quantum state causes it to collapse. And this means that actually checking for errors becomes a non trivial operation. Okay. The third problem, and see, so yeah, I need to observe an error without observing the data that I'm trying to store. The third problem is that quantum states are analog, so they just so there's not an error is not just uh, described by either my bit flipped or my bit didn't, but I can also have a tiny rotation like e to the i times delta times the Pauli x operator. And fourthly, quantum states cannot be copied. This is the no cloning theorem by Park and Wooters back in '73 or Zurich and Dieks. Like one of them did it early in the other, but they're all we 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 attribute this to all of them. Um, and this means that, you know, the previously just simply copying a quantum state multiple times and kind of executing this, the pieces of the calculation on them and then checking them against each other, this is completely impossible. 
but yet, we have a way forward that we've known about for probably about 25 years now. And let me try to explain this, uh, some, some details of how. So, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the quantum repetition code. So I'm just going to try to repeat all of the stuff I did in like four slides previous. And then what I'm going to do is, I'm, uh, is every time I get to a point where something fails, I'm going to show you how to patch it up. Well, the first failure comes straight away because I wanted encoding on the repetition code. Remember, I took x and I went to x, x, x. Well, I'm not allowed to take psi to psi, 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 because no cloning. Okay, That's a problem. However, there's a nice simple trick around here, which is that instead of cloning the state, I can expand the basis. Okay, It's a subtle point, but the key thing is, you know, psi here is a0 plus b1, and really all the quantum information here is not stored in the 0 or the 1. The quantum information is stored in the a and the b. What I do is I, I am allowed to copy 0 to 0, 0, 0, and I am allowed to send 1 to 1, 1, 1. That's very simple. You just use two C not gates and you've got it. So this, this, this is how we solve the no cloning theorem issue. You don't do, yeah, you don't do like repetition on, on states. It, it does also make it, uh, you know, the, the issue still kind of crops up because I'm not allowed to like, you know, take a quantum state that I've taken a long time to repair, copy it, and then, you know, do multiple, try, try to like do some parallel processing on that, which would make things a lot more useful. But uh, this, is what we have, this is what we have, and that's what we have to deal with. Now, let's consider, instead of now thinking about, you know, previously I talked about a bit flip on a classical bit, right, oh, which is just I potentially turn, um, flip it around from a 0 to a 1. Well, that definitely exists on a quantum state, and so we call this the bit flip channel, right? Not a terribly physical channel, I think, for most devices. Because, but, you know, but still, I guess you could think about like coupling to a photon field. We actually have photons in there, and so you know, you actually have a chance of exciting and a chance of de-exciting, which is the same probability. So, what does a bit flip channel do? Well, a bit flip channel sends um, sends from takes, takes me from zero a zero plus b one. It takes me to a zero plus b one with probability one minus p, and then it just lead and, and sorry, and then with probability p, the flip occurs, and the flip is that I flip the basis states. Okay, so A and B are still there, but the, the basis of the states are flipped around. Now, the encoded state, exactly the same thing occurs, like kind of on the previous slide. Instead of having, you know, with probability 1 minus P cubed, I stay in exactly the same. And, you know, again, with probability 3P times 1 minus P squared, I go to 0, 0, 1 plus 1, 1, 0, or some permutation of these, of these qubits, okay? That's nice and simple. So at least, at least the errors in this case work exactly the same for the, for the, for the uh, initial, initial case. Okay, so now what I have to do, well, I have to play the game where I detect, like I detect the errors and I correct them. Now, detection, okay, cool. So I'm going to look at my state. The idea is I'm going to look at my state. I'm going to see that this, the, the, the third bit is flipped if this was a thing that I wound up with, with, pro with probability p squared times 1 minus p. And then I'm going to diagnose that. I'm going to flip it back, right? Because I'm going to do my majority vote. So you'd want to go with, you know, you want to correct that to, to there. Now, there's a problem here. Who can tell me what I'm, what's going to happen if I, if I go through this procedure? What will I actually see? Exactly. I'm going to collapse my wave function, right? If I just go and look at all three registers, I will either see 0, 0, 0, or I'll see 1, 1, 1. Well, actually, what I'll do is I'll see I'll, I'll either see zero zero one or I'll see one one zero. But I've destroyed my quantum information. I can no longer use this state for further computation. Okay, that's a problem, and that's something we need to get around. So, how do we get around this? Now, I think you may have all. Um, I, I was told that Andreas went over a bit over um, like stabilizer measurements when he was talking about the surface code. Let me maybe do this again because repetition is. is usually useful. So a stabilizer measurement is as follows. Let me consider the, the bit, like a bitwise measurement of not measuring, a, not looking at a single one of these bits. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the product of these two bits, or like the bitwise sum, right? And so, the thing, and so we call this like Z not Z1 because these are poly operators. And this is just, I'm a theorist, I apologize. Um, but yeah, but you know, I look, at, I look at the bitwise sum of these two bits. And you'll notice that even though these two states are completely different, the bitwise sum of these two bits is zero. The bitwise sum of these two guys is also zero. And I can also do the same on, on these two states on the right, right? The bitwise sum of these two bits is one. The bitwise sum of these two bits is one. Now, you could take a third bit of information by looking at like, the bitwise sum of this guy and this guy. But it turns out that's like the sum of the bitwise sum of this guy and this guy and the, sum, and the bitwise sum of this guy and this guy, right? So there are only kind of two, two 
um, two parity checks be made here, okay? And this is great because this does not tell me any, the, 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 these, these two parity checks do not distinguish between these two states, okay? So I don't get to collapse I don't get to collapse the, the, the state. I still keep A and I still keep B. I can still use this for further computation. But I do get to diagnose that, you know, okay, this Z1, Z2, the fact that, this, that the, the bitwise sum of this bit and this bit is one, well, that's not supposed to happen because if you remember the state I started off with, which is zero, 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 or one, 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 the bitwise sum on all pairs of qubits there is always zero, okay? This diagnoses that an error has occurred. And so then I can say, okay, well, which, what do I think is more likely to have happened? Well, this, it turns out that this, this bitwise diagnosis is either coming from 0, 0, 1 or 1, 1, 0. And so I actually can, can, can say, okay, I think that I'm in this state or this state. That probably means that the rightmost bit is flipped and I can do the same correction as before. Okay, you can do this, identify that. And now I can do the flip without ever having to look at the state, right? Because we can do an X operation on a qubit. Cool, I've returned back there and I've succeeded. And so then the error analysis is the same as before. The pseudo threshold of the, rep of the quantum repetition code is 0 0.5 against the bit flip channel. Assuming now there's a couple of assumptions that made, into, that made it into here and I'll, I'll get to, and, and so now let me, let me try to break some of these assumptions. Well, the first assumption, which is, well, uh, the first important thing is that I've just said, okay, I'm just gonna do a, I'm just gonna do a, a two qubit parity measurement without, without actually looking at any of the individual qubits. And I'm sure this I've just made like every superconducting experimentalist put their head in their hands and go, no, you can't just do this, right? Two qubit parity measurements that are completely non-destructive are very are kind of difficult to do. Like, you know, you're just, just connecting, connecting your two qubits to a single resonator. In principle, it is possible. There are papers looking into this, but it's challenging. The easier way of doing this, and, and especially, sorry, like two qubit parity measurements, possible but challenging. But you know, you might have seen from, from Andreas' slides, and I'll get to this in a second, that for the surface code, we need fourfold parity measurements. And fourfold parity measurements, like doing it directly in a non-destructive way, is going to make any experimentalist pull their hair out. So <laughs> we don't propose to do it like this. Instead, the way that you do your, um, the way that you do your, your uh, yeah, but we need to make sure that all the information, we need to make sure this is a non-destructive measurement. And so the way we do this is we use a helper qubit, commonly called in the literature an ancilla qubit. And what this thing does, so this is this circuit here. I should go to the next step. Oh, so yeah. So what this, this circuit does is I prepare this, this helper qubit in the zero state. I do a C knot between this qubit and this guy, where like I control a knot based on the state of this guy. I control a knot based on the state of this guy, and then I read out my ancilla qubit. And if you do the math, you'll check that this ancilla qubit actually just, just stores the data of the bitwise XOR and nothing else. Okay, so I measure out this, this ancilla qubit and I leave this qubit here to kind of sit there while the measurement's being done. You repeat this many, many times. This kind of, you remember I was talking about before that we split our circuit up into multiple rounds, like, and we, we let errors accumulate over each round. Well, guess what? Here is like the, the native block or like time block of my, my quantum error correction, right? This is my error correcting cycle. I just do this and then typically in superconducting hardware, if you really try to drill down the measurement time, this thing's gonna be something like a microsecond, okay? Great. And then you repeat this many, many times to try to store your quantum information for as large a time as possible. And you need to, but the thing, and the thing here with analysis, and this is one of the reasons why your error correction, like your threshold goes below 50%, is that you're no longer just saying, okay, errors occur over like this period of the circuit, right, before detection, but errors can also occur during this period of the circuit. This, say for instance, if you get an error here, it's detected on one qubit, but it's not detected on the other qubit till later rounds. This gets very difficult. You have to do what's called a, you have to write down a classical piece of code called a decoder, which is very, very difficult to write down. And this is currently one of the big challenges facing theoretical quantum error correction, is getting classical decoders that can actually keep up with the, the runtime of the device. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, that's basically that. And the most, probably the most famous decoder for this purpose is uh, based on what's known as the minimum weight perfect matching algorithm. Cool. Um, now, how am I doing for time? Okay, I've got another 20 minutes and I would like to get onto a little bit of error mitigation for, for because I think people might be interested in that. Um, so I mentioned, so let me just skim over this slide a little bit quickly and then if people want to stop me, then please feel free. Um, the point is that you might remember that you, know, you can have a coherent, a small coherent error, which might be, so instead of me necessarily flipping this bit, like so x2 is actually like the x operator on this qubit, 
instead of actually flipping this bit with probability p, which is an incoherent channel, I can have a coherent channel with some small delta. And I think on this slide, yeah, I haven't fixed this yet. This actually should have an i in there, which you should always make sure you get your imaginary units right, because they'll bite you in the butt otherwise. Um, but so what this does is it doesn't actually send me to either flipped or not flipped, right? It sends me to some coherent superposition of flipped or not flipped. So how do I deal with this error channel? Well, if I do the, so if I do my measurement, right, I, I, I write down this thing, and now imagine I do my, my bitwise measurements on these guys. Now remember that I've chosen these bitwise measurements precisely so that they don't collapse the basis state. I don't collapse this superposition. But because the bitwise measurement distinguishes between this state and this state, I do collapse this superposition. And that's a good thing. Right? So somehow, yeah, so if p equals cos squared delta, we go to the, the we, we have no error occurred. With p equals sine squared delta, an error occurs. Now this is actually, so something that's an imp important point to make here, right? Analog computers, analog classical computers are perfectly possible in theory, but you don't, they don't exist. This is despite the fact that in principle, in a single analog bit, you can store the world's information, right? You know, you can, you can find the world's information, all the digits of pi, yada, yada. The reason why they don't exist is because we don't know how to collect, correct precisely these kind of errors on a classical computer. But somehow, despite the measurement paradox being like a pain in the butt for the experiment, because we have to introduce ancilla cubes and everything else, it actually saves us because without this collapse, we would not have quantum error correction. And the fact that we can do this is actually if people, are work, I don't know if anyone's working in adiabatic quantum computing, but this is actually probably one of the fundamental reasons why adiabatic quantum error correction seems to be difficult to do is because digital quantum computers have this ability to digitize errors. Okay, incredibly useful. It's like a, but it's definitely a poison chalice for, you know, the, the increased experimental complexity. Great. Errors is screwed as between stabilized measurements. Now, let me tell you now where this code fails and why you, why you will not see, like, you know, why people are not planning on just scaling up to larger and larger repetition codes. The reason why it fails is very simple. It's because quantum computers don't just have bit flip errors. As well as having, as well as my computer potentially going from zero to one, all I need to do is to pick up a random phase between the zero and one state, and that constitutes an error, and that will kill your quantum computation. Okay? And the repetition code cannot actually correct against phase errors. It's, it actually makes them worse. Because suppose, you know, it might, so a phase error, if you might remember, is like with probability, so an incoherent phase error is with probability p, I pick up a minus sign. I go from zero plus one to zero minus one. Now, as good experimentalists, you all probably know that really what happens is that this thing is just like it picks up an e to the i phi, some kind of phase. But let's just take the simplified model to, to make the point. Now, what actually happens here is the probability of this happening on any one of these three qubits doesn't, it goes to 3p. And I don't get to, this, this error is not picked up by my stabilizer measurement. So I don't get to save this. Like this, this just makes me worse and worse. So a bit flip error can correct against either, well, it can correct against bit flip errors. You could also imagine putting your qubits in the plus, plus basis instead of in the, the zero and one basis. And then it would actually correct against phase errors, but it would amplify bit flip errors. Okay, you don't get both with this code. So we need to find a code that can correct against any local quantum error. Um, and, 90, and, and, and 1997, Dan Gottesman proved, and this is kind of why I'm talking about bit flip errors, he kind of proved that as long as you can correct against local Pauli errors and like products of local Pauli errors, um, and products of stochastic local Pauli errors, which are like these, these bit flip channels, which are not physical that I've been describing, then you can get everything. You can get T1 error, you can get um, in, like co small coherent rotations. You can kind of get all of the types of errors that actually occur in the experiment. The one exception to this is leakage, but there's been a lot of work on people, you know, designing ways of mitigating against leakage errors as well. Okay, cool. And so then the thing that we, oh yeah, sorry, leads to a stabilizer formulation of quantum error correction, um, it's, which is a very beautiful formulation. Okay, let me talk about the repetition code in practice. This is an experiment that we did, I think, back in 2021. I don't actually have the citation here. But okay, what you see here is exactly the thing I described kind of previous, right? It's a quantum memory experiment. We take a state, we store it for n rounds where going n goes from zero to 50, right? And as we do this, we, every single round, we make a parity measurement and that kind of, and like the, the length of our, of our parity circuit dictates how, how quickly we can put these dots. And then we decode the, we decode the result, we see how well we've done. Okay, and so then we can fit an exponential decay to estimate the error rate per round, right? So that's kind of, that's what these blue lines, this, this, these lines are behind the points. And if you get the, um, 
so yeah, if you take if you take the the gradient of this line as it goes to zero, you get your logical error rate per round. Okay. Um, what we can do then is we can fit a straight line to this in the code distance. This gives us what we call the lambda value, which is the suppression rate. Right. This tells you how quickly I suppress my uh, my error as I go to larger and larger code distance. This is a really important number because a you want it you need to be greater than one if you're going to get any, but basically lambda greater than one is the definition of being below threshold. And the second thing that you need, the second thing is that you need to, uh, you know, this also allows me to say, okay, I'm going to run a quantum algorithm. I want to have say 10 to the minus 12 error rate. I know my physical error rate or like my error rate starts off at some point up here. And if I drive this down and down and down and clearly have to go much, be much below 21 qubits, um, eventually I'm going to get to uh, 10 to the minus 12 error rate for, for the logical qubit, okay? So that's why like lambda lambda gives you the rate at which you will get to your error rate. Yes, Alejandro. Suppose these these two lambdas are for two different experiments. Yes, yeah. So one of them is for the 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 I just mentioned from the previous slide that you can also protect against phase flips but amplify bit flips by encoding your qubits in the plus basis. So I encode a logical plus state as plus 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 and a logical minus state as minus minus minus. And then like I just instead of measuring ZZ, I measure XX. Okay? Perfectly possible. I mean, you know, it's just it's just checking whether how you are against like T two noise versus versus bit flips. Cool. So that's great. And then yeah, sorry, exactly right there. <laughs> and so you know, and I guess the, the the nice thing to say here is that you know it's a nine hundred and sixty nanosecond circuit. We get a ten to the minus four error rate per per cycle. And so this means that we have what's well, not really a qubit because it can only connect correct against bit flip errors, right? But we have a logical bit made out of superconducting qubits with a lifetime of 10, minute, 10 milliseconds. Cool. So that's the repetition code, which, as I mentioned, is not a full quantum error correcting code. Um, the thing that is a full quantum error correcting code is the surface code. Skim, skim over this really briefly. Um, and this is back, goes back to Kitaev in 1997. And the idea is here. Okay. Now, I think by the time people get to the repetition code, we after sorry, by the time people get to the surface code after the repetition code, we kind of tend to skim over the, the details of this. But on this checkerboard, right, I have blue and I have green boxes. And if you can't see it from far away, the blue the blue circles contain an X and the green circles contain a Z. And what this means is, if it's, if if this circle contains a Z, I'm saying that my parity check is a fourfold Z Z Z Z check. Okay. The way that we do this in experiment is you, you know, you you just do four four C not gates between those four these four qubit these four qubits on the corner of the square, and the central helper qubit. If it's a blue swan, I have to do an X X X X parity check. That's done by this circuit up here. You can check that it does exactly the same. Any questions on this? No. Nope? Cool. Okay. You've hopefully you've seen this before. Um, yeah. So that's how you do put together the surface code. And then uh, all single, you can check here that if I have like an X, basically if I have an X error in, in this qubit, that X will anti-commute with this measurement and this measurement. So an X error will get detected by these two stabilizers. A Z error will get detected by these two stabilizers. And you can check that all single and actually all products of less than D over two errors give you like a unique signature on this grid, which means that we can correct them. And that means that the code, the, the code distance of this grid if d is the square root of the number of data qubits, the code distance is given by d over 2. Oh, sorry, the code distance is given by d, the number of errors it can correct is d minus 1 over 2. Great. Um, you have, yeah, you have d squared data qubits. In order to do the measurements, we need d squared minus 1 parity checks. This entire plaquette encodes one logical qubit. And yeah, you can talk about the, the, the logical basis states that you're encoding. For this code, it actually becomes very, very difficult to write down. So what you tend to do is you tend to talk about logical operators, which are actually just the product of x on every single qubit and the product of z on every single qubit. There's a whole amount of theory that you can go into here, which is like one entire university course. I only have, uh, well, 10 minutes left, so I'll, I'll skip on that. I apologize. If you have any other questions, please feel free to ask me during the, um, during the break. Does anyone have any questions on this right now, then? No? OK. Um, oh yeah, the most important point, probably the most important point of all of this, and a very, very depressing point, but I said previously that classical error correcting codes have a threshold of 50%. This code is the, the, it's, it's, it's the one that we like because it is the code which has the best threshold rate when you actually put in you know, full circuit level noise. Okay? So that means that I, I actually look at 
coding up these measurements, and I, I allow myself to put errors in all of these places, and you know, and then I and then I, I see what the threshold is against that level of noise, and I include the fact that my decoder now has to account for error detections that occur at different points in time, and actually correct all of those. When you put all of that together, the threshold is 1.5 percent. Now this is kind of a lot less. It's a little bit depressing because that means I have to get all of my components down to about 1% or less. In fact, we probably prefer to be about you know, a factor 10 or 100 below that in order to do any error correction. But the nice thing is that we are actually already there, right? So not just Google, but many, many um, groups across the world have started reporting you know, error rates on large, like 20 qubit plus devices of 1% or less. And I think this is actually one of the big reasons why we've seen such an outburst of quantum computing and in interest from industry is because people do know that those numbers are important because it does put us below threshold. In principle, as soon as you're below threshold, all you have to do is feed more money into the problem and go to larger and larger systems and wind up with like, you know, stadium sized quantum computers, but maybe they'll do something cool. Yes. No, so the threshold is saying that this is the threshold at which going to a larger distance will decrease your logical error rate. So it's kind of like it's like the distance of the threshold is the one that's, di that's distance independent. There's also a thing called a pseudo threshold, which is usually like around a similar value. And the pseudo threshold is kind of only defined between any pair of distances. But the threshold is the one where like, it's kind of like the threshold is the, the pseudo threshold at D goes to infinity. But they're, they're all honestly within like a, a few, a few like they're, they're, they're quite close to each other. So. It also really depends on the, the type of error model that you're using. Okay. And so this is, I mean, I, I, so this is milestone two. I'll tell you why it's milestone two on the next slide. But this is the, the, the plan for the, the demonstration of this. Um, is basically if we take a D equals three surface code, this has got 17 qubits, um, nine, nine data qubits, eight ancilla qubits. We go to a D equals five surface code, which has 49 qubits. And the goal here is to do exactly the same as we did with the repetition code. Now, because the threshold is a lot, low, is a lot smaller, and because the number of qubits is a lot larger, it's kind of hard to like as a first proof of principle to go beyond just doing like D3 to D5. But the real goal here is to actually show that we can go to a higher distance quantum error correcting code and suppress the, the logical error rate. So this is, uh, this, is, this is our milestone two. It's a work in progress. Um, progress is going relatively well. Uh, but uh, uh, the reason why it's milestone two is because it's sitting at the second point on this roadmap. OK, so, um, so this is our hardware roadmap for the next 10 years. And basically, I gave the last 30 minutes of lecture to try to, understand, to, try to explain why we're pushing in this direction. And the idea is that we, we go to, we're, we're, we're planning on doing this in the surface code, right? Just because it's the code that we, that works quite well for superconducting qubits and, you know, has a very low threshold. And the idea is we started in 2019 with our Beyond Classical experiment, which probably people have heard about or read about 10 times in the news because it seemed to do quite well. Um, then the next plan is to build a logical qubit prototype, which is exactly the experiment I described on the previous slide. And then over the next 10 years or so, we're planning on pushing this up to more and more qubits and just increase this every time by about a factor of 10. Okay. Now, from a physics side, I mean, obviously, every advance that we can get in fundamental physics and every advance we can get in terms of driving, down, driving up qubit performance and driving down errors is useful. <coughs> but the main thing for us is to point out that at some point, once we get up to a tileable module, this really just becomes a case of fitting the things together and trying to drive down cost and, and drive up reproducibility, which is an engineering challenge rather than a physics challenge. So, you know, we're hoping that as we make progress along the way, we're going to get more and more excited about the fact that we actually will get this to work. This is our plan over the next 10 years. Yeah, question about that. So the idea is, so, I think, a one, uh, think about 1,000 physical qubits, you get about a distance 25 or so logical qubit. And the idea is the, 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 the plan here, like 1,000 is a rough ballpark figure. I mean, you know, this said 100, but in principle, we only need 49 to go from d equals 3 to d equals 5. And the idea is we want to, for, for, to get a logical qubit, our, our milestone 3, we're defining as roughly, you know, having a qubit with a lifetime that's longer than about a day, right? Like a fully error corrected. Um, qubit that we can store as a quantum memory for, for say, a day or so. I'm not sure what the exact number is, but that's the, that's the plan. And 
So I increase the, yeah, very good question. If I increase the number of qubits, I can increase the code distance, right? So if I go back to the previous slide, going from d equals three to d equals five, so a d equals five code, I have to have three errors in a short time frame that sit close to each other in order for that to give me a logical error. Distance three code, I only have to have two. Distance seven code, I can have to have four. Distance nine code, I have to have five, et cetera, et cetera. And so the idea is that as, I, as long as I'm below threshold, so if you're above threshold, then it turns out that the rate at which these errors occur, just because I'm you know, going to more qubits, that will kill you off. But if I'm going to, um, but as long as I'm below threshold, then adding more qubits, the fact that this re means requires more errors before I, before I get killed, um, this will give me an advantage and I should decrease my, my, my logical error rate. And once I've gotten that, then all I need to do is just keep, and, and decreases exponentially, right? And so all I need to do is add more and more, co like more, more and more qubits and increase the code distance. And in principle, we should be able to go to as large a lifetime as we can possibly want. Now, in practice, probably, you know, like we'll have some limit, which is just the size of the device. And so we'll probably put a cutoff. I think we're setting a cutoff of somewhere like a day or so. Don't quote me on that. Well, you know, that, that I, I don't know what the precise number is, but but yeah, the idea is that we want to go for something, but about a thousand qubits is about the level at which we think we can, we can do this. And then, really, given that most um, most fault tolerant quantum computing applications require something like about a day to run, this would actually be the requirement for, for you know, encoding the data that we plan on doing quantum operations on. Okay, and you can kind of see this because then, also once we go to one logical qubit. Then going to 10 to the 6 gives us about 1,000 logical qubits. Some of those qubits have to be sacrificed for doing gates, because you have to do gates via uh, magic state distillation. But yeah, so then um, but with the remainder, this will give us enough that we think we can go kind of, you know, do, a quantum, do quantum computations that are useful that nobody else can do, but require, you know, like the, but, but also um, be able to sustain the, sustain the quantum compute, uh, sorry keep the quantum computer um, surviving until the calculation actually completes. That answer the question? Fantastic. Um, any other questions on the roadmap before I... I mean, actually, I've only got five minutes left, so maybe we should cut it here and go for lunch. I mean, and I'll just skip on the error mitigation. Yeah, please. So sorry. Is <coughs> that's a really good question. Um, so the assumption that we make that our errors are stochastic, we we break you you can break that to a significant degree and still kind of work. Um, I mean, basically, if I if I can say say so, I go back here, right? If I can survive, if I can survive against any two, so the d equals five surface code can can protect me against any two uncorrelated errors. That are, that are like weight one. It can also protect me against a single correlated error that's weight two, which the distance three surface code cannot do. Okay? And so, yeah, so basically this, this will allow us, so, oh, what do I wanna say here? So, and that, that kind of like continues on. So if I go up to say like a distance seven code could in principle protect me from like a single correlated weight three error. Now, if you keep going, and like you find, and if we find out that when we get to like distance 20, we have you know 20 qubit correlated errors, like some kind of standing mode that interacts with all of our qubits at the same time, well then we're 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 kind of humped. <laughs> um, there there is, I mean, there is no, I don't think there exists any code that can kind of protect against you. I mean, oh, you you definitely cannot protect against all poly errors because protecting against all because some of those poly errors are going to actually be your logical operations. Um, but I think that, uh, yeah, definitely, like, here we're kind of a little bit safe by locality because I don't think anyone's really observed 20 qubit correlated quantum processes in nature. I mean, you can definitely get kind of, like, long range. And if you get, say, like, long range physical errors where, say, qubits 1 and qubit 20 always have an error at the same time, those you can still treat as, like, two independent errors and you just, you're losing the ability to, like, error correct perfectly by treating them as uncorrelated. But if you have a large enough code, even treating them as independent errors, you'll still be able to pick both of them up, if that makes sense. So there's a lot of errors that we can correct against, but, you know, I mean, yeah, we can't correct against everything. Go. You mean in physical size? Oh, geez. 
Yeah, so I don't know, I'm trying to, so most of the cube, most of the qubits we have, uh, so, oh yeah, right, well actually I've seen, I've seen a, you can actually get, so you can actually get a, a copy of the 53 qubit or 54 qubit chip is in the Deutsches Museum, you can actually go and see it with your eyes, although I think the, the chip is like, you know, kind of covered over on the top, but it's roughly like a couple of centimeters by a couple of centimeters, so probably 10 square centimeters or so. <laughs> We're going to a very large ship, so I don't actually have. There's a there's a slide which I can which I, I've taken out of this deck, but I, I can probably find and show you. We think that like the final million qubit quantum device is going to be probably like the height of a person for the electronic stack, and like you know, probably like uh, about 10, 20 meters long. Like it's 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 going to be it's going to be it's going to be a big well you know I mean but it's, it's going to be a big device but it's a big physics experiment and I think if you compare it to say the size of the LHC then we've got a, well, you know it's not so bad right um, and I I, because I I would I would say here that honestly it's not actually the size of the it's it's not the size of the chip that really matters right the bigger issue is actually the size of the electronics and the size of the couplings that are going in and out of the device and that's what's going to make that's what's going to be our bottleneck when it comes to making a, a large thing a, a large system. Um, Sorry, we have to put the huge chip in the fridge. But this is this is luckily. I mean, you know, they they've they've built some pretty big dilution refrigerators, and you know, like and 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 we it is it is in principle possible. We don't know of any physical reason why this can't occur. But it is you know it's a big endeavor. Like no no one's trying to pretend that it's not. We are we are planning to do error detect. So so once so if I go back to like the surface code, right? Or even if I go back to the repetition, maybe it makes it easier to see on the repetition. You see, kind of here, right? Every single one of these points requires that we take we measure. So you know we have 21 qubits, um, and what uh, 11 of them are being used as data qubits, and 10 of them are being used as ancillary qubits or helper qubits. Sorry. Every single time you see one of these points, we've taken a bit's worth of data from each of those helper qubits. If I go to a million, a million data, sorry, a million total qubits, and half of the, roughly half of them are used for the, for the, um, for the, for the error correction. This means that about every microsecond, we'll probably be taking 500,000 um, bits worth of data from the device, which we then have to run through a classical decoder, process the data, and get and kind of like you know store what errors have occurred or detect what errors have occurred and store what errors have occurred in that time frame. I think that someone once did the math on this, and I think the number is something like, uh, I think we might actually be beating Netflix in terms of like uh, Netflix's global output in terms of the amount of like the, the, day, the bandwidth that this will produce. Now luckily a lot of this, the processing can be done on site and the processing becomes easier as you make your qubits better and better, right? Because if I, it's seeing no error, if I don't make any detections that an error has occurred, that's really easy to correct. But this is, a, this is actually one of the big bottlenecks um, and it's a big theoretical bottleneck in building a big quantum computing chip is actually getting a decoder that can scale to that size and keep up with the device. Other questions? By the way, thanks for the people who have asked questions. They've all been really insightful. And now I get more questions. <laughs> sorry, uh, sorry, we'll go one, two, three, yeah. Um, that's a really good question. You mean what I do personally, or or like what uh, what the the team does on the experimental side? More like the, experimental. the experimental side. Um, to the best of my knowledge, not really. I mean, you know, I, I, I guess I guess you know maybe we've got like we, we. I think our team's a bit larger than Walrafs now, um, and maybe I think I I'm not sure what his clean like and then but you know we still use a clean room facility. I think and I think actually academic clean rooms are quite often competitive with. <laughs> You know, with with stuff that's not like like a fabrication lab for like a semiconductor chip or something. Um, so we still use clean room tech, and I think the clean room tech we use is basically the same. Um, we have our own, you know, we kind of have our own electronic stack, but I think that's similar to any other superconducting academic group. I mean, really, Google Quantum AI is an academic group that sits inside Google. It's it's not. We're not like, yeah, we're we're not that different to be honest. So yeah, 
which I guess also answers the question about my day to day. It's, it's, it's surprisingly similar to just being an academic. Yeah. And then there's a question there. This is a really good question. The answer is kind of we're still working on that. I mean, I think it's it's a problem that we're already facing as we go from from kind of like the hundred hundred qubit scale to beyond like the thousand qubit scale, just because not even like keeping up with the fluctuation, but even just calibrating a thousand qubit device is, is quite challenging. Um, I do one of the nice things about running quantum error correction. One of the nice things about getting five hundred thousand bits of, of information out of your device every second that is primarily designed to detect error, like things that you haven't like you know the, it's presumably mainly designed to detect miscalibrated devices is that you can actually get a very good idea of whether or not like gates have gone wrong in on one particular qubit based on just reading the stabilizers around and in fact this is actually one of the things that we do you are uh, one of the things that we show back in back when I was in Latin like 2017 you can recover if you write down like a grid of qubits and you want to write down like the error rate per qubit you can recover this from the stabilizing the measurements themselves. I mean, you're kind of recovering like RB numbers rather than you know a full quantum map of the of the device, but you are actually able to get all this data from there. So one way you could imagine doing is that we can like diagnose that some when qubits are becoming miscalibrated and kind of like set and then just shift the information off this part of the lattice and then re do like local recalibration. I mean, this this sounds like a complete nightmare, but. <laughs> You know, we, we, we'll just have to see. We'll just have to see what we can do. And also, we're hoping to, you know, find stabler qubits, find ways of reducing error. I mean, it's not like we've stopped with um, improving the the or like pushing on like the the quality of our devices and the materials quality, etc. It's just you know, we're 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 maybe not like when we're, we're not being like pessimistic about it, but it's just we don't want to we don't want to rely on like some poor experimentalist working in a lab to find the next magic piece of like you know. The, the next magic, the, the next bit of the secret sauce that will will like you know drive our rates down by a factor of ten. And so we like to assume that everything is going to go poorly, and then still have a way a path through to like something that's useful. All right, I think we should stop here. Thank you very okay. much. <laughs>